Folks, we're live. I apologize for the uh, delay there. It's a few technical issues, as we frequently do on this show. Uh, this is what happens when two rangers are hosting and producing and directing and every other freaking thing. Um, but we are so happy to have with us today. I'm going to see on the first try, Mark. Mark, right, let's see. Polymeropolis. There you go. All right, awesome. Mark is a former CIA case officer or operations officer. He spent nearly three decades with the Central Intelligence Agency. He served all over the Middle East, and uh, he also spent some time in Russia, uh, which we'll get in probably towards the, the latter side uh, of this show. Um, we're very excited to have Mark with us today. Um, I'm Jack Murphy, by the way. This is co-host Dave Park. Thank this you for joining us live tonight. And um, I think we'll jump right into it. I mean, Mark, usually, uh, Dave, you go ahead and ask it. This is, this is your, sure. your time here. <laughs> so, Mark, uh, I, Jack and I are both big comic book geeks. And so we always like to ask our heroes, what's your origin story? Like, where do you come from? What was your childhood like? How, what drove you or how did you wind up in the CIA? Sure. So that, that's a, that's a great question because you know everyone's got you know everyone has to have some kind of journey to this kind of weird life that we all led. So um, looks so you know I I was uh, I was born in Greece. My dad was Greek. My mom was uh, you know lived in Long Island. They met in college, um, and then my father had to go back and do his Greek military service in his mid thirties. Imagine that an enlisted an enlisted Greek army in nineteen you know in the late sixties. I don't know. He said uh, he said his his, uh, his boots smelled a lot, but. Uh, no, so I was, I was born in Greece. Immediately, I came to the United States after that. And just because of kind of this, the, the interesting upbringing, um, you know, we ended up going back to Greece each summer. My dad traveled all over the world. And then, you know, when I was, when I was 10 years old, my dad had a one-year sabbatical teaching in Algeria, of all places. This is before the insurgency. And I know you all are, you know, you know certainly follow kind of CT, uh, you know, issues in North Africa and elsewhere. And so, but so my father and I, when I was 10, we drove 2,000 miles in a Volkswagen minibus through the Sahara Desert um, for a month. And, uh, and I fell in love with, you know, the region. I mean, I, you know, I thought I was Lawrence of Arabia. And so, you know, I, I kind of had an idea. I wanted to come back and do something with the Middle East. And, you know, after, after kind of uh, going to college and then, uh, uh, you know, I applied to the agency. And it's, 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 it's scarily enough. It's the only job I've ever had. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, I just fell in love with the region, wanted to go into kind of the, you know, the espionage business, um, probably read too many Tom Clancy books. Um, and then, uh, then off I went into kind of a, a crazy career. And how did you get into it? Like, did you approach a recruiter? Sure. Yeah, no. So, so, you know, so I went to Cornell university. They had, you know, it's a, you know, it's a place where there's, you know, there was a history of, of, you know, folks going off to the agency. Um, it was also a time, though, and, you know, I, uh, this is 1991, 92. So, you know, there was, you know, the CIA is not the most popular place on an Ivy League campus um, or, you know, uh, necessarily. So I remember when I had my interview, there was an office of security guy outside with an earpiece, probably armed because um, there was protesters on campus. But it's just what I wanted to do. Uh, it's amazing I got in because, in my, you know, when I, you know, all my friends were not taking, you know, like, all the background stuff seriously. So I think when, you know, when. When the security investigators came to interview them all, you know, I think they walked into a room. There was probably, uh, you know, crushed beer cans and a giant bong. Uh, and they asked, they said, you know, have you ever seen Mark do any of this stuff? And they said, no, definitely not. And, uh, you know, it was the whole thing just kind of uh, it deteriorated from there. But, uh, you know, no, so it was just coming right out of college. And then uh, then, then off I went. I, to wait, I actually had to wait a long time for my security clearance because of, you know, being half Greek and, and all the overseas travel I did and all kind of the kind of, the, the kind of crazy things. And, uh um, and I did have to sign some kind of special dispensation um, for not misbehaving because of all the stuff they saw that uh, my friends were doing. And so when you got hired, it, it took a while. When you got hired, what happened next? I mean, did you? Sure. So interestingly enough, so I, I had, so, you know, I served for 26 years at CIA. I got hired. I, you know, I did, I did my undergrad. I, I got a master's degree as well and kind of, uh, you know, in, in, Public policy, but really focus on Algeria of all places. Since that, you know, I fell in love with it years, early, years earlier, and I wrote my, you know, my master's thesis on Islamic fundamentalism and, and the and the rise of the Islamic Salvation Front there. And so I was hired in for the first two years into the director of intelligence. So I was actually an analyst for the first two years, um, uh, amazingly enough. And and they put me just like everything else in CIA in government, you know. So I was an expert in Algeria. So I became an Afghan analyst. Right. So you know that that makes sense, of, of course. course, exactly. Um, 
And then, uh, and then I switched over to do Palestinian affairs. And then I, I took a trip um, to the Palestinian Authority areas and traveled all throughout the West Bank and Gaza. And I came back, and my boss at the time was a my group chief was a guy by the name of John Brennan, of all people. You know, uh, you know, clearly of of, of, of you know fame, uh, becoming the uh, director years mm-hmm. years later. Um, but I went to him and I said, "Look, I want to become a case officer, and I'd love to. I, I want to be overseas. I want to run operations." And he said, "Just you know, without without hesitation, yeah, sure, no problem." And I look back on that. I must have been the shittiest analyst of all time. I mean, they didn't even try to keep me. Um, so it, it was, you know, it's, and, it's, and years later, as when when, the, when Mr. Brennan was the director, and I, you know, would see him in brief, and we laughed about this story because uh, um, clearly I, I wasn't I wasn't set for that for the analytic track. So then I went off, um, you know, went through our you know our requisite training, which everyone knows about, you know, down the farm, which you're not supposed to say the farm, but everybody does, um, and then uh, uh, and then off um, to doing you know for. Most of my 24 to 26 years uh, doing Middle Eastern um, uh, issues. Uh, Mark, you had a really interesting story you had told me actually about 9 11 or the aftermath of 9 yeah. 11. I was wondering if you could tell us about you know being ground, being down there at Ground Zero with the Joint Terrorism Task Force in New York City right. at the time. So, so you know the the and I think a lot of your listeners and, and you know viewers know the Joint Terrorism Task Force was kind of you know really interesting phenomena that was born in which they, it was a kind of a multidisciplinary lots of different agencies you know worked together in the United States um, uh, on you know originally on, on counterterrorism issues and it's it's, it's evolved um, but so I was you know I was I was in New York and we were there and, you know I was living there my my family and I you know we lived on the Upper East Side we actually were not at work that day. Um, uh, but I'll tell you, my daughter's daycare center was at World Trade Center five. And so, you know, it's pretty emotional, you know, what happened, um, several days later, we were actually out of the city. So when I finally came back, I remember kind of going through the rubble, um, and just, you know, uh, uh, you know, with, with, with the FBI and, uh, you know, we're trying to recover there, you know, there was, there was obviously the World Trade Center come down, but there were some federal buildings there. So we're trying to recover some safes and material and, uh, uh, that, that was kind of strewn all over the place. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you can't say this, uh, yeah. Mark, but I remember it was reported on the news at the time that there was an agency building in that right, area that right. was destroyed. Yeah. So, so obviously a reason why I would be in that area. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, that's probably probably what I can say. But I'll, I'll never forget five days. You know, uh, after and the, the you know the the rubble that's still smoldering. And then this is I mean, it's a true story that. We're walking through, and there was a—I don't know if it's a New York City fireman or a policeman, but in full kind of regalia with a bagpipe, and he was—he's playing it, walking through the rubble. And I mean, people—you know—you get tears in your eyes thinking about it. Um, and so, just an extraordinary moment. You know, I, I was there. I stayed in New York for. And so again, you know, I, I thought a lot about you know, having—I would have dropped my daughter off at World Trade Center Five. I mean, I think, you know, there's a lot of stories about kids being orphaned by individuals, you know, who had the same kind of situations. They—they they had their kids down there than working in the towers. I don't know if that's true, but, um, you know, certainly motivated me to do counterterrorism work. Uh, you know, I don't think there was a day that walked, you know, that I had the rest of my career that I wasn't motivated after, after what we saw. And, and, you know, so I stayed on in New York for, um, for a bit of time. I started clamoring to go into Afghanistan with some of the teams, um, uh, just like a lot of other people, but I'll tell you, it's it's one, one funny story just that, you know, as, as, as there was a lot of investigations that were going on in New York city, I remember my, my boss, the station chief, she called me in one day and she said, Mark, you know, you know, I was watching ABC News last night, and and I saw someone in an FBI raid jacket, you know, with the, with, you know, the yellow FBI in the, in the back, you know, and, and there was a raid in, in a bodega in Queens, and it sure looked like you. And I thought, you know, no way could he have been so stupid to do that, put on an FBI jacket, run around and get caught on television. Uh, and so I, uh, I said, I didn't say anything. I walked out and I gave, gave uh, you know, the couple of couple minutes later, I brought the jacket back and gave it to her. So <laughs> that was my... Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, Mark, great times, you know. Amazing, you know. It really, I mean, when you think about everything that happened after nine eleven, having been there was just a tremendous motivation, and, and uh, really pushed me to do a lot of CT work over the years after. I, I think this is an interesting uh, segue, or maybe maybe a teachable moment for John Q. Public, because a lot of people have um, confusion out there about the CIA's role domestically in the United States and the laws sure. that apply to you guys and. The things you can do working in conjunction with the FBI, right. and the things that you cannot do. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. right. No, it's a uh, Jack's great. It's a great question. Look, so so you know, there's a couple things, a couple different things. First of all, you know, we do have a you know, there's there's domestic collection that can be done. In, in essence, there's a you know, there's a there's a very patriotic 
um, motivated business community that travels to a lot of places around the world that that the CIA wants to talk to, and that's what some of some of the things the things that you do. Look in New York, there's I, I'll just to be frank, there's at the United Nations, there's a thousand diplomats. Um, that is a tremendous recruiting ground, and so there's a you know there's uh, so clearly there's some interest in in, in us having access. Uh, to those to those uh, individuals, and then there's the then there's kind of the work with our federal law enforcement partners. So the JTTF is a tremendous concept. Where look, I was a, a case officer. I spoke Arabic. I was able to help um, with the law enforcement um, kind of brothers and sisters. And and I'll tell you, and and this is this can be a theme that we get to later. Everybody early in my career, whether it was from the Joint Special Operations com uh, Community or the FBI, I ended up somewhere down the road um, being with in some you know some third world country. I mean. FBI HRT deployed with us uh, into Iraq. Um, FBI special agents went on to become legal attaches. Uh, it is a very small community. And so those kind of original days in New York um, were really important to me uh, in kind of making those connections and, and really working with some great people that, that, that I saw down the line. Mark, we've all seen the movies, so out of curiosity, is there a CIA hit team in every major city, or are they all flown in individually when, <laughs> right. when there's... Exactly, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, despite all of my, all of, all of any, anyone, any CIA officers uh, who, you know, lives uh, and works in the United States, you know, would love to have a badge and a gun, but, you know, we're not allowed to have that. Um, I did manage to get, and, and I tell you, if, if, and I think, you know, as, as, uh, uh, as New Yorkers, um, I did manage to get an NYPD parking pass. That is a coveted piece of, of hardware. I just slap it on my dashboard. If I needed a roast beef sandwich, deli, I'd pull up right there in front of the fire hydrant. That thing was gold. That's so, nice. uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's I should have kept it. And then after 9-11, what was your first experience, you know, actually deploying to the Middle East? I mean, sure. how did that all come about? Like, you were there at Ground Zero and... Like how how did you get into that fight? How, how did that go down? Right. So so you know one of the one of the great things about the agency is that you know first of all it's small. So the case officer cadre um, and and really the director of operations, the whole organization is, is small. There's there are more FBI agents um, uh, assigned to New York City than there are CIA case officers worldwide. So it is a small it's it's a small group. And so you know look a lot of us were really motivated. So first. First and foremost, I wanted, and, and for not for lack of good work, but I wanted to get get back to the get out to the Middle East, um, and so uh, you know, uh, off we went to an assignment in North Africa with the with the goal of kind of slowly making my way as the teams were you know were were uh, are going in. So I you know I was not on one of the original teams in Afghanistan. I ended up going to Kandahar in March of '03. So the first teams I think went in October of '02. Uh, but nonetheless, it was still kind of a, a really interesting and kind of you know wild time. I mean, I remember you know going whether it's the you know the uh, you know our, our, our newly opened station um, uh, in Afghanistan, or I you know when I went to Kandahar, it was the old governor's palace, which still there was a, there was an SFODA and a couple agency officers, um, and uh, you know I was still pretty pretty green, honestly, as a as an operations officer, and so. I mean, I have so many great stories of this, but, you know, look, I, I was not, you know, I was, uh, I told you, I, I was not, um, uh, you know, former military. And I remember my first night when I got into Kandahar, um, they said, you know, you have the, the you know, the, the four hour shift, whatever, 12 a.m. to 4 a.m. So I kind of go up to the roof and this is my governor's palace. You know, occasionally we take some incoming, uh, mostly small arms fire. And uh, and we had, we had some Blackwater um, uh, uh, kind of the folks there to help us with this, this one guy was former SEAL. And he goes, hey, take this. I said, what the hell is this? Because it's an AT4. Um, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, and he's like, hey, you know, just let us know what happens. And, and, and he goes, and he kind of climbs down the ladder. And I'm sitting there, and uh, uh, I'm thinking to myself, um, yeah, I'm not sure how to use this thing. <laughs> so, so ultimately, uh, uh, I kind of, you know, I, I kind of, uh, you know, called down to the, to the boys below. I said, hey, can you guys come back up here? Like, which way does this thing fire? I mean, so many of my stories are kind of self-deprecating like this because, you know, I, like, one of the things I always say is, I, you know, I volunteered to go everywhere. I was a pretty good officer. Um, but so much of the, the greatness of, of the agency is that, you know, you, you get some really solid training, but you can make a big difference by, you know, by really kind of, you know, raising your hand. Um, but the time, you know, the, look, the, I got the bug with this, the time in, uh, in, uh, in Kandahar. Look, there's, you know, when we would go into, you know, chasing HVTs in, into Helmand, for example, this is March of 02. The, the Afghans there thought we were, were Soviets. They hadn't seen anybody. I mean, these are rows of poppy fields. Um, I remember one time, and if you don't mind, I got lots of stories to of tell. Course, so you please. know, you know, keep on, keep on having some beverages. But we were 
there, there was a kind of it was called a high value target it was kind of wasn't wasn't that important but it was it was someone that we wanted to capture and um you know uh uh you know the oda um got a uh you know got got a, i think they got uh task force 160 to drop him you know to airlift their their hilux vehicles into Helmand with the idea if we catch the hvt you know we'll blow the vehicles and get a ride back out so, uh, so I, so, you know, later I, I got a call, I got, you know, I called, called back to our, our, our head shed, got some money because there was going to be a little financial transaction between us and the tribal elders and, uh, you know, fly in there, get to the ground. Um, you know, I talked to the, you know, to the, the, the captain, he's like, Hey, like, here's the deal. Like, you know, we got to catch this guy. Cause if we don't, we got to drive back the 13 hour overland drive. And I was like, all right, fine. So we sit down with the tribal elders. You know, and this is, I mean, this is, you know, I, I look back to my time where I was reading, like, a book by James Michener called Caravans about mm -hmm. a foreign service officer in the 1950s. And then, you know, and I read that when I was a kid. And then years later, I'm sitting here, same thing, cross-legged with some Afghan tribals. And, I, you know, I say, look, we have some money for you. We'll build you a well. We need you to hand over this this guy. And um, uh, I'm pretty green at this point. I mean, really, honestly. And, and, and uh and so one of our one of our interpreters, and you all know this, you know, kind of there's, you know, we always listen to the, the ICOM chatter. This is the insurgent communication. So they, they pick something up and someone, they come and they tell me and the, and the captain say, hey, this whole thing is bullshit. If this is an ambush. They're going to kill all you. They have no intention of handing this, this guy back. So I so we said, all right. So the captain and I sat in front of the, the tribal elder and the captain said, what do you want to do? And I said, all right, I'll, I'll take a crack at this. And I looked at the, the, the tribal elder and I said, look, there's, and, and I'm making this up. I said, look, there's, you know. They, they, they feared the AC-130. They feared the Spectre. They were terrified of the Spectre gunships. I said, you know, you know, there's one of those up top, and if, if anything happens to us, you know, uh, you know, we're going to, frankly, kill everybody in this village, you know, uh, every man, woman, and child. And, uh, you know, the, and afterwards, I joked around with the, the captain. He's like, yeah, that, that kind of works. So they, the, the, the tribal elder said, all right, let's, uh, let's have some more tea. They called the whole thing off, but we had to drive back. And, again, as being the green agency guy, and I would never do this in the future, I went to the, you know, so I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna prove myself to these ODA guys. I'll sit in the back of the Hilux for 13 hours with the Afghan <laughs> Indich, you know, cuddling together. It's it's freezing cold. So we did a 13 hour overland drive, and I thought I was gonna die. And these dumb, you know, these guys and these grizzled SF guys were in the front laughing their ass off at the stupid case officer. But at the end of the thing, it was really important that I kind of showed myself I wasn't better than them. It was you know great team building. I remember thinking on that trip I might freeze to death. So. Yeah. And so I got the bug with, with, with kind of doing the CT work. It's, you know, it's exciting. It's, uh, there's an incredible sense of self-satisfaction. You get to work with tremendous individuals. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, like, later on in my career, we can talk about it. So I, I did regular tours at embassies, and then I went off to do kind of the, the you know, every once in a while some, some war zone stuff. But I spent almost three years in kind of the, the, the you know, different, different arenas um, uh, because, frankly, it's, it's, uh, it's the work I loved. One of the things that I'd really like to get into you with that you said that, you know, you also enjoy talking about is the the psychology of recruiting sources, of recruiting assets, which is, you know, really the bread and butter of what you did throughout your right. career. So, I mean, I would love to hear your take on that. And, and, and you know, how, how, does a, how does a case officer do their job? What, what, what do you do to get inside a person's mind and gain their trust? No, it's this, and this was what I loved about the job the most. So, so one of the things, and, and, and you get better at it. So, you know, I joked about being green. I was, I was, you know, you know, you know, coming out of training, um, uh, you know, you are, you are really sharp in terms of your skills. Um, uh, but one of the things that you learn quickly, especially the way CIA um, works, and, 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 you know, I, uh, perhaps it's, 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 it's a, a bit different than the military because we're clean, because other intelligence services don't know who we are. Um, very often we are tasked at a very young age with handling the most sensitive cases. So the penetrations of, of you know, uh, uh, hostile intelligence services or hostile military. So when, when you're young, that's when you get kind of the sexiest stuff because you're sharp and nobody knows who you are. So I'll never forget. Um, and, you know, and, and this is, this was, you know, uh, uh, early on in my career, I was tasked with handling, it was a penetration of an Arab government, um, you know, hostile to the United States. And, uh, and we had what's called an out-of-country meeting. And so, so you know, I was training them on communication system for kind of denied area operations inside, uh, inside back in his capital. And, and at one point he stops and he's, you know, and, uh, you, know, I, you know, things are going well. And he said, look, I just want to tell you something. He said, he said Mark, you know, every day, um, you know, I know, I know what your life's going to be like. You know, you have other things to do. Uh, uh, you know, you're going you're gonna to watch, you know, American football on Armed Forces, on AFN, like everybody else does. And you're going to have a beer at the 
you know, at the, uh, at the, at the, at the embassy, you know, pub. And so you're going to think about me sometimes, but, but let me tell you something. I'm going to think about you every single day because if, if, if you mess up once, not only am I going to die, but my whole family is going to die. So I'm going to think about you every single day. And he kind of looked me right in the eye. And I was just, you know, I was struck by this. And that's, you know, as, as, at a young age, a CI case officer has really an astounding responsibility. And because um, if we if we screw up, you know, on our trade craft, on a surveillance detection route, um, something with a communications plan, you know, someone someone can really uh, uh, get hurt. And so, you know, and that's and so so I take that. And then you have that that relationship you have with someone is is unlike anything else on the planet, um, you know. So so you're sitting across from someone, whether it's you're doing a brush pass, whether it's a hotel meeting, whether it's a car meeting, that agent. And you know, again, remember, CIA officers, we're officers, not agents. That agent, the foreigner we recruited, uh, um, you know, you you develop this. I mean, it's a, it's a romance. I mean, it's an incredible relationship with someone um, that's really hard to understand unless you have someone else's life in your hands. And it sounds dramatic on this, but it's really what I felt. And so just that, that aspect, um, of, of even the handling of, of, of agents is really extraordinary and really important. Um, cause again, it's, it's, you know, it's a human business and, uh, and if you screw up, someone's going to get hurt. How did you do that? How did, how do you go into a, a country and get somebody to, I mean, betray their country, uh, and, sure. and come, come work for Mark. Like, Hey man, come work for me. We'll take care of you. How, how does that go down? But so, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, I love talking about this because there's, you know, because things have changed over the years. So, you know, in the past, look, for, well, first of all, you know, our job as a case officer is, is to look for vulnerabilities of a target. The idea that everybody is, every foreigner is recruitable is, is silly. Um, so we're looking for specific things. Now, in the Cold War, you always look for, for example, you know, there's the, the conflict between obviously communism and capitalism because so, so a potential, you know, uh, 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 agent could be, Someone who has is disaffected, you know, in the past with the with with communism, with the Soviet ideology. Things have changed a lot now. In fact, it's much more personal. So if you're looking for individuals who have, you know, who are vulnerable for a certain reason, maybe they want their kids to go to an American university. Maybe they have a sick relative who needs care in the United States. Um, maybe they're part of a, a minority of of a government. You know, obviously, you know, things like Christians in the Middle East. There's a glass ceiling. They can't grow. You know, they can't rise up in their foreign ministry or their intelligence service. Um, or, you know, uh, or, or, or maybe they, you know, they've been, they, they've, you know, it's, it's based on ego. They haven't, they haven't progressed as well in their line of work. So you're looking for that. And then, you know, it's, it's just finding ways to, you know, it's, it's a little bit of manipulation. It's psychology, you know, it's a psych 501 class. It's not a one-on-one class. You're never going to get someone to do something that they don't want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of critical. So it, it's always finding that vulnerability and moving them towards a place. And, and frankly, we live in a country in which, you know, there are, there are, you know, the ideals of, of freedom and democracy really do resonate um especially in the third world mm-hmm. uh uh and, you know and and so um you know it's a and, and the other thing is you deal with failure you have to over, overturn a lot of rocks i mean you know so so define you know so in, in a typical you know overseas assignment you know you're not going to recruit you know 15 agents that doesn't happen you know it's going to you know, you've got to do a lot of work finding those those individuals in countries we care about um uh so so you know i always I, it's, there's there's great baseball analogies here you know if, if you hit 300 you know, that's extraordinary. But you got to learn. You, you learn to deal with a lot of failure and trying to find people who, who kind of want to come to work for us. But they're out there, and and, and they're out there. You know, uh, in in every target country, whether it's Iran, Russia, China, um, uh, that's you know the the one thing about America is that we do stand for something, and that really to me that really mattered. I used that a lot, and that it was uh, it was. Uh, uh, I mean, I I've done, I I remember things like I mean. You have to understand, America, it's not only American democracy uh, or the, the ideals of democracy, it's American football. I've had targets who love the Pittsburgh Steelers. I would be off in the Middle East, and I'm like, i got to somehow get back to the States and get someone to get, you know, Ben Roethlisberger to sign a helmet. And now this didn't happen, but that's the kind of stuff we do. Right. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure to get it to the, and so, it, you know, it's stuff like that. Or it's, hey, hey, you know, if, if you ever come to the States, I'll take you, I'll take you to, uh, uh, you know, a New York Giants game at the Meadowlands. And so... It's the American ideal. It really does work. Without, like, I, I know you're limited in, in what you're able to say, and sure. I, I can only even ask for, like, so many specifics, but uh, is there anything you tell us about, you know, in non-specific generalities, like how you talk to somebody and, and got, walk them through that, that whole process of recruitment? Well, so, so what I, you know, so everyone has a different style, you know, and, of course, there's, the, there's if, if you're lucky, you got to walk in. 
you know, that's someone who's just going to volunteer right away. And that just that, you know, and there's a there's a there's a lot of stories of this. And you have to, you know, if you're if you have the right profile, you know, so the idea of this, you know, the, the, the you know, glad handing, you know, loud American and diplomatic functions, that's not really what works. Mm -hmm. You know, so so if someone's going to kind of volunteer, they're going to look around. They might be able to find out who the CIA case officer is, but they want someone who they know they can trust and not, you know, and uh, and keep their, of course, they keep their lives uh, uh, intact. Um, one of the things I always did successfully, you know, look, I, I'm a Greek background, so I was in the Middle East. Um, uh, so, you know, Greeks and Arabs have a lot in common. Is You know, so, you know, you, you, you kind of gain the trust of not only the, the target, but the family. Um, and this is not manipulation because at the end of the day, if, if I'm going to ask someone from an Arab country to, to spy for the United States, um, you know, don't forget, in my view, it's, you know, it's for the right reasons. Um, and so, so, and we might be helping the family in some matter, but we, I, you know, I just uh, kind of what I always do is I try to get, you know, we try to get closer to the family, um, you, you develop a personal relationship, uh, at times, sometimes that's hard because after you recruit a target, sometimes you have to turn them over to another case officer when your tour ends or, or for, for a variety of reasons, maybe your cover gets kind of shredded. And so that's hard. Um, uh, but it's, it's very personal. Again, it's, 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 it's talking to someone. I mean, there's so many, you know, you know, techniques that you use, but you could say things like, you know, boy, that, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that, uh, uh, big, uh, big meeting our foreign ministers are going to have next week. Um, it's really important to us. You know, the ambassadors asked me to kind of, kind of get a feel for what, you know, you don't know anything about it. And I know you can't tell me a lot, but, um, you know, give me kind of some of the atmospherics, um, uh, and then, and then maybe they say some things that they should or shouldn't, not that big a deal. And afterwards when it's over, there's no intelligence passed, but I'll go and I'll say, Hey, look, by the way, you know, the ambassador, like, you know, I got, I got, you know, they gave me the, uh, you know, 500, $500 gift certificate to this restaurant in town. And I'd like to take you, you know, and you kind of, so, so you, you kind of start the process of, of, of an exchange of, of information for something tangible and you kind of, kind of move it down. And there are a lot of times you can tell that the, the target's like, no, not interested. Okay, we're good. Um, but a lot of times they know what they're doing. You know, I, I always thought that people who are, you know, end up getting recruited, um, you know, uh, knew what was going on and they, and they, were, they, they wanted to go down this road again. And I, I'll say it over and over because of who we are, because we are, you know, because of what America stands for. Um, and so, yeah, but it's a, it's a, it's a really personal kind of uh, uh, business in which that's what I, that's what I loved about it. Mark, you say it's a personal kind of business, and you know, popular media sh paints you know movies in Hollywood, and then all the conspiracy theories paint people in the CIA as heartless, cold, calculating. Right. How do you deal with the humanity of knowing you're putting this person in danger, or when you have to pass them off, having formed a relationship with them? Because you're not totally immune to that, right? Right. Well, yeah. So, I mean, so, but, you know, I'm still, I'm still human, you know, it's, and, and you know, if my, any of my colleagues who are watching this now or who know me, I mean, that, one of the hardest things I ever had, the most difficulties I had was, was in that kind of, that turnover when a case officer has to turn it, someone over to another officer, because I usually develop such a strong personal relationship. Um, but, you know, it's, I mean, you know, again, it's it, my, my thought on all this is whether it's a, a penetration of Al Qaeda or, you know, an Arab diplomat who, you know, we don't have great relations with, but we need to understand um, their country more. I mean, you're always you're doing it for the right reasons. Right. Uh, you know, every once in a while you'll get you'll, you'll handle it or recruit an agent. It's based just based on kind of that mercenary, you know, maybe monetary transaction. But, you know, like, like I just that, you know, my my success um, was always much more based on doing it for the right reasons. Um, and, and just, you know, using that American ideal. I mean, I, I tell this story and it's corny and it's just, but it's what I believe. I mean, you know, there were so many times where I was in some crappy country and, you know, I, I walk at night and I go and I walk by the U S embassy and you see that flag, you know, in the silhouettes, you know, the flag flying. Um, and you look there and there, there you know, might be a small embassy and there's not a lot of Americans there. And there's a, if, you know, you're in a hostile area. And so I'd be proud of that, but I'd also know that people actually walk by there and, and that flag meant something. Um, I have so many funny stories in the Middle East of, uh, and I mean, so, you know, I'll, I'll tell you one story. I remember someone came for, to get a visa and, you know, in the visa interview, you're asking questions and I, you know, you, and you have to ask them some, sometimes questions about, you know, they're, you know, do they support terrorist groups? And I, one time I asked this person, I said, you know, what do you think of Hezbollah? And they said, we love Hezbollah. They're, they, you know, they're, they're freedom fighters. They're, they're, they're going after the Israelis. And I said, yet yeah, you want to come to the United States? You want a visa? And they said, yeah, of course. It's America's a land of opportunity and democracy. And I'm like, all right, like. Like let's pretend like so, and I kind of like this person. I'm like, 
let's start this interview again because that, that Hezbollah part is really not going to work. <laughs> they, they weren't terrorists, um, right. but but they saw you know they could support Hezbollah. Hezbollah is a really is was you know in all of our, a lot of our our minds was the A team of terrorist organizations, a really hideous uh, organization that killed a lot of Americans. And um, uh, but in this person's view, it, it was a, just a political movement, and but they wanted to come to America, the land of opportunity, and it was. So you know that's you know it's a uh, uh, yeah, I'm I'm still a sucker for that you know and, and even now with the crazy kind of political atmosphere you know when you're when you're overseas you see that American flag at an embassy or you're deployed somewhere with the U.S. military a flag means something um, and it means something to a lot of other people too not just us yeah did did you ever lose an asset overseas Mark I mean did you ever yeah. have that happen you know it's you know it's it's that kind of the the, the kind of transition the, the first time this happened is is so so you know I talked about that first. Uh, uh, a kind of Afghan trip in Kandahar. Then I, I came out of there. I, I was posted at a, at a North African embassy. Then Iraq was kicking off, and I kind of made noises that I wanted to, to go do that. And so I was um, sent off to, to northern Iraq. This was uh, December of '02, and I think you've had some other guests on in, in the past who have yeah, done nice. that kind of duty. And so I was up, at, you know, living with the Kurds. I mean, it was you know wild time. You know, it's, we arrived there. There's only a couple Americans. There's there's you know there's, uh, we have kind of a, a little trickle of cold tap water we're living with the Kurds in the mountains like literally our team was was near the Iranian border um, uh, uh, as, as in all great you know CIA deployments the first thing you know the two things we need when we get there is weapons and beer um, and so I remember that the, 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 the Kurds this is the PUK the uh, you know one of the one of the kind of legendary you know, Kurdish groups I said what do you need and I said Amstel beer because I knew they had it and then you know, lo and behold we had crappy food but we had beer so that's that's a theme of all my my CIA stories but on, but on a serious note, um, that was the first time I lost an asset. It was someone who, you know, was crossing over into regime lines, took too many risks, um, kind of was giving us, you know, good information, the order of battle stuff that was basic building block as, as you know, in the run-up to the invasion. And and, and he was caught, and, and I found out he was tortured and killed. And that really, that really hit me really hard for two reasons. One is that's that's a personal relationship you had with someone, and, and I knew he was dead. And number two, um, I blame myself because, you know, there was such a thirst for the information um, uh, and this was an eager agent, eager to please us. Uh, I should have, I should have kind of reined, reined him in. Um, and that's a lesson I. It's, it's interestingly, it's a lesson I took l later on, not only for other um, agents and uh, uh, similar to that that I ran, especially in Afghanistan, but also kind of in stuff I do now, te teaching on leadership, um, uh, and just kind of having that kind of sense of humility and patience. Um, that, you know, that short-term gain we were getting out of the order of battle ended up costing this guy's life. And you know, I, I certainly blame myself for that. That's, um, that and it's, it's hard. I mean, that's, you know, I, I still remember this guy. Um, you know, he knew what he was doing. He knew the risks he was, he was, he was uh, undertaking. But, uh, uh, you know, every once in a while, it's a really hard business. And, and I learned that later on as well with, with some other kind of unfortunate times. That's got to be so difficult for uh, such a situation to be in where, you know, you're a member of America's premier, you know, strategic, strategic human intelligence gathering organization. Uh, you're an alpha male type go getter. There's all this um, uh, pressure coming down from the White House. We need this intelligence. Right. This is national security stuff. This has got to happen right now. But then there's also this human being in front of you that perhaps, you know, higher echelons, they could give a shit less about that guy. But as you said, you have a relationship with that person, and maybe you also see a longer-term play here that this guy could be a long-term asset for us. But if he gets kanked his first time out, well, you know, you're, I mean, you're 100. There's, there's, so, so you're you're 100 right, and I always so of course so headquarters and the analysts back home, you know, are, are loving the information. Mm -hmm. um, but but your role as a case officer, you're almost an advocate for the asset as well. Um, there's always going to be a push for more. There's always going to be push, not always, but you know, some, maybe some enhanced risk taking. But you end up being correctly so the advocate, uh, and uh, it, it and it is interesting sometimes because there you know, there can be kind of conflict. I mean, there's you know there's I, I you know I have to rack my brain. There's so many different stories I had um, about someone in headquarters, sometimes in senior positions, who they said you know get this you know uh, this this asset to do X Y Z, and you're like, yeah, that's that's a little risky. Um, uh, or, or, or sometimes you think that they can do something and, and then, you know, you get the kind of the, the no from back home, but yeah, I mean, yeah, look, the, the, that, that time, you know, it's funny that as it, it, and I, I, I wanted to tell you this all today, that was the first kind of true experience I had. And it's the, it's the name of this, the show, the team house in Northern Iraq at our base, which was in, it was in Kalachulan. It was, you know, we had a team house, 
Um, it was a giant table in a room where we all had our little laptops. And by the way, the other thing you didn't ask me is what's the biggest, the, 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 the most important uh, uh, skill set for a case officer is your is your typing ability. <laughs> Not shooting. It's your typing ability. That's what, that's the biggest misnomer, and, and, and Dave's laughing now. But, you know, you got to be able to type. Uh, but we sit around the laptops, and that, you know, and, and that kind of camaraderie we had in this really strange environment. We're along, you know, our, we had no expo plan. You know, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of the helos from, from Insulik were like, we can't get there. We can't, there's, there's not, a, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the amount you got to carry out. So, so literally, we're like, we had a couple of forestry speakers. We we're going to walk into Iran if Saddam was going to come across 32nd parallel and just, we figured the Iranians would kind of like wonder who the hell we were, but that was our expo plan. But you know, this kind of great team environment, and I'll leave you with one story where, you know, uh, it's a, it's a, I can't tell you his name is retired, but a legendary ground branch or paramilitary armed ground branch um, officer. And I was sitting there one day and we were kind of scraggly and he looked across the table from me and he just looked up at me and I, I saw him and I was like, this isn't going to be good. And he said, the fighting lamb shop. I had these sideburns. You do stupid stuff in these things. My hair was long. I had a big beard, and I had these sideburns. And he just said the fighting line. Then the second that came out, I was like, I am so screwed. <laughs> and that stupid name just lasted forever. I'd walk through the halls through Langley, and I'd hear Lamb Shop, and I'd be like, ah. <laughs> um, and so, but you know, and, but that's the kind of stuff you miss. This kind of incredible camaraderie. And then interestingly enough, a lot, you know, a whole bunch of those officers on that deployment, I was with forever afterwards. Whether it's at you know traditional post. Uh, in Afghanistan, um, but boy, those times are uh, are, are, uh, are memorable. I, I want to get more into that, but you reminded me that that operation was run through Turkey, and I'm just thinking, a Greek CIA agent. Oh, they great. must have loved yeah. you, man. They must have loved you. You know how we got in? So we had to. We had to. I, we would fly into uh, Istanbul, then take a Turkish air flight to Diyarbakir. The flight I was—I remember when we first went in December. The flight the previous week crashed and killed everybody on board. Um, it's Turkish nice. air in the middle of winter. Then we drive from Diyarbakir, which is this really kind of rough old town where the you know the PKK used to operate, and we were linked up with the Turkish special forces who saw me with my great old name Polymeropolis, and it was awesome. We had a great relationship, and, uh, and we drive through the harbor gate all the way across northern Iraq. Um, uh, and so, uh, yeah, so, so, you know, look, I've gone in and out of Turkey. I got along with them fine, but it was, but my, my last name always uh, was, look, at the, at the end of the day, you know, Greeks hate the Turks. The Turks look at the Greeks as like, kind of like an annoyance. Um, so it wasn't that bad. It was, uh, you know, but my father would never forgive me if I ever said I was, I was working with the Turkish special forces. That's for sure. Yeah. Because your dad was probably like, you know, Constantinople is Greece. End of story. <laughs> Well, absolutely. That, that, he, that, that those words have come out of his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I want to talk sure. more about the uh, Iraq mission, um, but I just want to hit you up. Uh, Jerwin Cook chimed in on the chat here, and he said, uh, "Just here spying." Mark looked out for officers on the promotion panels, and it was appreciated. Yeah, that's nice. It's good. You know, so you know, look at the at the. At the tail end of my career, and that's far past all these times here, when I was promoted to senior intelligence service, you know, at that point, uh, you know, your operational days uh, are, are, you know, of fun as a case. Like your, your, look, your days as a line case officer is the most fun you're ever going to have in your life. When you're when you're managing several hundred or several thousand people, it wasn't that fun. So I, I switched my whole mentality to try to take care of my officers. And so I absolutely loved sitting on promotion panels and fighting for officers who I knew um, really had what it took. And so... You know it's that that when you, when you switch into that mentality of mentoring, um, uh, you know that that was the reward that I had because because most of the other crap is a is a senior headquarters SIS officers personnel issues. You know some commo guy has been in some like you know I don't know he's he's in some S and M room in DC and like can we deploy him then to Moscow? You're just like oh my god, uh, and, you know and so, no but seriously and so but 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 then when you get to do a promotion panel we have people come and ask for mentoring and that's that's the stuff that matters because. All I want to do and what I want to do at the end was just pass the torch to the next generation. And that's what that's what really matters. And, and I'm telling you, like, the, the whole point of we're not going to talk politics on this, but I'm telling you, even at the end, like the last two years when I was at a senior level with, with the Trump administration, everyone asked me the effect on the agency. There were people walking in the door as motivated as ever before. Um, you know, people joined the CIA for certain reasons. And, and you know, they certainly did after 9-11. But even now, and so I love that motivation, and, just, and you want you want to tap into that because you know when you get old and grizzled, that kind of goes away a little bit. So. Yeah. When you say that you would fight for these young officers uh, on the right. promotion board, 
Was it just because you knew? Was it because there were gatekeepers, or would everybody kind of fight uh, to try to get people they knew promoted? People they knew were capable promoted. Well, yeah, no. So that, that's, that's, a, that's a great question because you know there are there are so ah, God, this is this is getting it's not getting to the weeds too much, but there's you know so so for example, there's a lot of officers that I, I knew. Uh, so there, there was no requirement for a war zone in CIA. Um, yet, yet in the 2015 time period, if you went through our war zone bases, just like all of us, we, we've been there time and time again. And, and so, and so, and, you know, and then you're wondering where the hell is everybody else? Now there's no requirement and it's okay. And sometimes there's reasons for people not to go. And I get that. And, and it, it, even now in 2000, uh, you know, 20, that, that whole kind of requirement is going to, is going to go for the wayside is because, because there's not, you know, there's not that many more places to go to. But for example, if someone said to me, you know, sometimes, you know, an officer would have done two or three kind of, you know, one year assignments. The development of a case officer, that's not a great thing. You know, you really need to go to do a high CI threat, you know, environment. You get some additional training. You go to a place where maybe there's a low CI threat for two or three years, get to recruit a lot. And then you go do a war zone. But some people love this kind of the adrenaline of the war zones. And sometimes, um, you know, people get penalized for that. Uh, and I was trying to, you know, so I would look out for them. Um, uh, or... You know, there's there's a really kind of. You know, I wrote an article in a uh, in a, in a this, this this NYU um, law journal, Just Security, which is really it's a great place to publish stuff. And I wrote an article about compassionate um, leadership in the sense of sometimes officers screwed up, and so you know, and so maybe ten years ago they did something and they paid the price, they went through the penalty box, but then someone on that panel is still holding it against them. Yeah, That's kind okay. of bullshit, right? And you got to call that. And so you get to a certain level of seniority when you're able to do that. And, and that's what I really enjoyed in the end, because, you know, for, for whatever reason, people would listen to what I had to say. Um, and so I really wanted to kind of take care of that young generation. Because I'll tell you one thing, like in life, I would rather take an officer who screwed up sometime, paid the penalty, can then walk into a, to an office and say, hey, I messed up. This is what happened. Mm -hmm. um, I had some warts, uh, did a lot of hard stuff, did, did a counterintelligence tour, did a war zone, did a regular traditional tour. There's a lot, a lot of tools, you know, uh, uh, in, his, in his or her toolbox, but but if there's a little blip, that's okay. Um, you know, I, you know, you want to see how people react to failure. So I, I liked, I actually liked pushing those officers forward for promotion because I thought they would actually do a lot better um, uh, uh, down the line. Now, when you say there was no requirement for a war zone, do you mean there is no requirements of training, or do you mean that people in the CIA were not case officers were not required right. to deploy like the military? Right, so so it, it changed. So over my career, so at some time, you know, every once in a while, it would be like everyone's got to do a war zone. So then, they, and then then they kind of pull back on that. So the the question, the, you know, the, the the you know the bottom line is for promotion, um, and it's changed over time. Is you know did did a one year war zone, um, you know, was that a requirement for advancement to a certain level? Uh, uh, there was a time where we had enough war zones out there where I thought that was a really good idea. Um, for so many reasons, because I think it teaches you a lot about yourself. Uh, you know, war zone service is hard. Um, it's important. You also get to be co-located with the U.S. military, which is a tremendous partner uh, across the world. And now when we talk about these buzzwords like near peer um, competition, like, so we're not going after the Russians and Chinese alone. We're doing it in concert with our U.S. military brethren. Um, now, now in 2020, there's not enough war zone slots to have that requirement. So it's a little bit different, but yeah, no, but to answer your question is, you know, sometimes it was it was required for promotion, sometimes it wasn't. But I just wanted to make sure that folks who did kind of the hard stuff um, were uh, were rewarded. Because I'm telling you, at the end of my career, like it, it's the, it's the, we we had, and I got to be careful on this. There was multiple station chiefs in Kabul who had been there many times. That that's ridiculous. Now they're great officers and they knew Afghanistan, but where the hell is everybody else? Right. So you're saying that if people did multiple tours, sometimes that would be, that would work against them. Amazingly they enough, gone, yep. They didn't do the embassy tour. They didn't do right. the, the real CI stuff. Right. Yep. Sometimes it did, and and, and you know, and and uh, and and they have to do that um, to to get to be kind of a full performance officer. You want to see, you know. So, for example, in Afghanistan, we didn't run a surveillance detection route on your own. You know, you got to be able to do that as a case officer. You got to have that 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 ability after a two, three, four hour surveillance detection route, um, changing modes of transportation, maybe changing your physical appearance. Um, you got to be able to make that split second decision. Uh, uh, now, um, 
uh, one of the things that uh, uh, we also have to be careful with is don't penalize people who, who want to do hard stuff. So, you know, if you go back and forth, I would take an officer, if, if it's a first tour officer comes out of the farm, comes to, goes to Afghanistan, comes to me in an embassy, they're, they're thinking they're hot shit. I recruited three officers. We, you know, we, I got some, some, some tactical intel. We called in some airstrikes, killed some HVTs. Well, not HVTs, whatever, but if you're lucky, some HVTs. Um, and I look at them and I said, right now for me, you did a year there. Thank you for your service. Uh, uh, you have not been on an SDR by yourself. You had what we call GRS. You had our global response staff, kind of get our, you know, some some shooters with you who maybe ran that that surveillance route for you. So you have to prove to me now um, that you can operate on your own. So it, it's a mix of stuff, you know, back and forth. And I'll tell you, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll the, you know the last part too is our paramilitary arm, you know, with with ground branch, air branch, maritime branch, our, our paramilitary officers, same type of thing. The, the the importance for them to go do a regular regular embassy tour, for example. Really important to get that kind of full skill set, and I loved having having these these guys or gals come because um, I knew I knew what they, they you know I knew what they did in the past, uh, and then you know and they were they were super eager to kind of learn that new skill as well. So, um, yeah. So back to Iraq, you yeah. were in there early on before the invasion, uh, doing the same mission uh, thereabouts with Sam Faddis, who we had on previously right. talking about it. Uh, you were down south, uh, I guess around Salmonia with PUK, yep. Sam's yep. a little further north with KDP. Um, right. Were you guys focused on the regime or more on the Ansar al-Sharia mission? Or like, how, how did that all pan out? It was both. It was both, you know, so it, it depended. I mean, so I would say, geez, how can I say, I'm, you know, in terms of this is going back a while. Certainly we're focused on, focused on the regime. So we needed to order a battle. No doubt, you know, the invasion was coming. We needed to know disposition of Iraqi military units. We also needed to, to get penetrations of the Iraqi military and, and, and intelligence services. So that was, that was, you know, that was my job there. Uh, uh, you know, the fight against Ansar is, is a totally kind of separate story and a heroic story, especially for our ground branch um, uh, officers there. You know, one day it'll be told. Um, I think maybe it was told about one of Bob Woodward's books. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, it was it was kind of a dual kind of CT mission with Ansar, but also with... Uh, uh, but it really was 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 regime focused. Um, you know, it's it's one of the most interesting. Kind of, I, I remember this clearly today because there's there's actually some books that have come out. I think uh, Robert Draper, the New York Times, wrote a book about the run up to the uh, Iraq War and a lot of the mistakes that were made. I remember in the team house we're talking about watching Colin Powell's address with George mm -hmm. Tenet behind him to the UN, and they're they're detailing this intelligence, and we're looking at each other and being like, "Where's that coming from?" If, you know, because we we had no WMD mission up in up in up in the north. So, you know, you know, it's, and so, but as you both know, those existential big picture things as a line officer, you're really not worried about. We knew we were going in. A lot of us had done from either uh, seats counterterrorism center or from the Near East Division. We've done or we we've been involved in Iraqi operations for a while. Whether you justify the war however you want to with the WND, the bottom line is Saddam was a pretty hideous character sure. um, who, who conducted, you know, who was, who was awful to his people. You know, we're up in, the, in, in Kurdistan, so, you know, with the, the stories of Halabja, the gas and the chemical attacks. And so there's no love lost with the regime. So we're kind of getting ginned up to, to kind of go on in. Um, and that's kind of the, the next kind of step in my, in my you know, life is when, you know, they said, all right, who wants to go in with, with uh, the Joint Special Operations Command with Dev Group? Um, you know, into into, uh, into Baghdad, um, and I raised my hand, and, and once again, as I, I joked about before with you, I find myself, you know, on, on an infill with Task Force 160 um, into into Bayak, you know, in a, a nap of the earth flight, getting shot at, thinking, I got to stop volunteering for these things. You know, <laughs> this is getting a little uh, getting a little crazy, and then, yeah, then no, I, I, I got to hear the, the, I got to hear this story. Amazing two months, yeah. No, I mean, it was, you know, I, I remember it was, it was myself was one of one of the dev group operators, and and I, my my uh, my chalk that that helo was uh, was all the combo gear, and they dropped us on buyout. And I remember, you know, sitting there, and you know, of course, no one came to get us, so we're kind of scratching our head. Um, uh, you know, there's there's uh, you know, C one thirty almost came in, plowed into us. I have I have thousands of pounds of, of agency combo gear, which crypto, I can't leave it. I'm not a, I'm not a combo officer. I'm kind of I'm like how did that? So anyway, bottom line, is we were okay. <laughs> But uh, there's a couple moments where you kind of scratch your head, what the hell am I doing here? But I went there because I had a source network that was developed up in northern Iraq that JSOC wanted to tap into. And we went in to kind of, you remember the deck of 55 um, cards uh, of, of the Iraqi uh, high-value targets. And so 
um, had a really unique experience there, uh, kind of, kind of, kind of running and gunning with those guys. But you know, the, but I, but I'll, I'll throw in like you know, again, what do we do as a CIA officer? The first thing on the ground, you know, day breaks, I, we get to our our, our location at Bayat. Um, we're sitting around scratching our heads, and, and it's only we, we had way too much time on our hands. We actually had a couple days, and we're thinking, you know, what do we need? Well. Is there a duty free shop here? It's, it's <laughs> not yet. And so we're like, yeah. So so me and a couple of boys went out and we found the buy app duty free. And within about forty eight hours, we had built the famous um, uh, HBT bar uh, in uh, in Baghdad, which was a legendary place. But I remember, you know, I remember, you know, putting the wood down. We had, you know, we obviously confiscated a lot of, uh, uh, you know, high uh, high quality uh, beverages. Um, and this this damn bar caused so much trouble over the years. Uh, but I'll tell you, there was, there was, you know, within within one week, there was a, a plethora of senior U.S. military uh, uh, officers, including flag officers, having a drink or two with us. That, um, that's impossible. Uh, they were under general. <laughs> impossible. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way they think it could have been drinking. <laughs> no way. Um, so yes, so the 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 HPT bar was great, and so uh, so that was, that's that's kind of the claim to fame. But but really, that was a really unique time. And there's a couple points on that. One is. The individuals I met from Dev Group, that's that's in two, this is in March, this is April 2003. I I ended up knowing and working with for my entire career to the point where you know um, uh, their leadership uh, you know down the line was uh, you know, were, were people I was familiar with, and so you know it was, it was just it was interesting time. I had the I had the assets on the ground. I had the Iraqi agents. Um, we were kind of wrapping up and, and, and rolling through high value targets. Uh, one of the things that that you both kind of know, I'm sure, is when you go into a conflict zone um, in the beginning, nobody knows what you're doing. So I had a shitload of money. I had no supervision, and I was assigned to you know uh, 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 I, I had a whole bunch of, of you know of uh, obviously elite you know special operators with me. Now to be fair, I had a whole bunch of GRS uh, 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 you know uh, officers with me um, as well, um, but. Uh, Boy, we had a blast there, kind of, kind of doing some just crazy stuff. You know, I remember there was we caught an HVT one time and had to get him and his family out. And uh, we, you know, one of my one of my buddies hot wired and we stole an Iraqi city bus. Um, just, just stuff that that you know when when I and I never asked for permission for anything. And I read about it in the cable later, and people were loving. It. I mean, I remember coming back and you know George Tennant, the director and and, our, and the DDO at the time were just like you know it was amazed. But that's the fun of these these kind of initial deployments. Um, where uh, we can, where where I think the ingenuity of the agency, um, coupled with the special operations, you know, uh, uh, community um, and and kind of a lack of supervision, you can uh, you can do a lot of good. Could you talk about what the the operational cycle was like at that time? Sure. I, I take it you were running the source network, providing yep. the intel that Dev Group was then using to go in and, and Shanghai some high value targets and Baghdad. Yeah, and so yeah, I mean it was it was nonstop. I and mean, I, so so I remember I did I, the, the the funny parts of this is then there's some very serious parts, but I don't think I you know I didn't take a shower for six weeks. Um, we were going nonstop day and night. Uh, a lot of it was, you know, was was kind of tactical intelligence. So you get a you get a you know a, a you know a tip or a phone call or whatever from the source now. So you're rolling. Um, you know, the, the our special operations, you know, uh, friends were fantastic, uh, and um, I think they're, uh, you know, I think I think ultimately it was a, it was a it was a more permissive environment at that time. This is April of two thousand and three. Than what happened later on, I do remember. What we were we were in, it was either Fallujah or Ramadi. It must have been Ramadi, and I remember driving through and it, with 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 Dev Group. It was an open back Hummer, you know, a Humvee, um, mm -hmm. and so you know, it wasn't up armored. It was, it was open back, and because we thought it was going to be okay, and all of a sudden the town's throwing rocks at us, and you started you started kind of shaking your head, saying, "Wait a second, we're not getting you know really uh, uh, you know received with uh, with flower petals." Um, uh, and so, so, but but it still was low, it was it was a more permissive environment. I mean, I, you know, there was I mean, there was there was still fighting going on in the city as well. So, um, you know, there was there was there was something the other day I, I I posted on Twitter. Just I always have these memories. Oh, I know what it was. It was it was the retirement of the uh, M1 Abrams, uh, M1 A1 A1 Abram tanks from the Marine Corps. So I remember. So the, the Marines took the east side of the city um, uh, in Baghdad. I remember we were running an op with with uh, uh, with with, uh, with, the, with the seals and. You know, as, as you know, we it was it was at night. We kind of I, there was there was two uh, two vehicles. We were kind of approaching the target's house, and then we saw on on, on the nods, a night vision, kind of the Fedi Saddam guys come out with RPGs, 
and we slowly crept back. Um, one of those other times when I remember one of the one of the, the one of the one of the boys in the truck looked at me and said, "Ah, we're fucked." And then I'm thinking to myself, once again, I volunteered for something stupid. <laughs> um, but we kind of crept back, um, found cover behind a Marine M1A1 tank, and the and the tanker, this this, this young Marine, has had half his finger blown off. And I remember jumped up. He had no freaking idea who we were because we were running around the city, you know. Uh, uh, and you know, I looked scraggly. Um, uh, and uh, and I remember jumped up there, and you know the, the moniker's OGA, other government agency. Everyone knows what that is. That's 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 the agency. Uh, but I said, hey, we're from OGA, and we're, we're running. And he goes, hey, whatever you all need. And I left. What the fuck happened to your finger? Half his finger, half his finger's gone. This guy was just tough. He's toughing it out, and I was so impressed by that. And so I, whenever I think of Marines and tanks, I, I think of that story. But I remember we then, you know, we called in, called in Little Birds. They came in. They kind of, you know, um, took care of the Fed and Saddam guys. We went in. Blew down the door. I was the second one through the door down the high value target. I come back and I tell these stories, and my leadership was like, "You will not do that ever again." Uh, <laughs> but again, that's the beauty of these these initial deployments. It was just so much fun, no, uh, and, uh, and really just just incredible times. I, I, I you know I remember even then having like me and one one of the dev group guys. You know we wanted if, if you all know Baghdad, the Monsoor district was there kind of fancy. There was an ice cream place. It was still open. I'm sitting there having an ice cream. Him and I are just total plain clothes. And I see some of our ground branch brethren, some legendary ground branch folks. You guys probably know them. Ended up being one of our, being our, being our DDO. And he's rolling through with some some dudes in a in a uh, you know in, in, in their battle route, you know, in in, in, a, in a in a Humvee, all all kitted up. And they looked over and they're like, "Is that fucking Mark having an ice cream?" <laughs> and they're looking at me. And I'm waving at him, and I'm like, "I'm in so much trouble." And I got back and I got just an ass chewing again, but. You know, we, we had some great success. It was uh, it was really it was it was the you know tremendous experience for me. And as a young case officer, still this is two thousand and three. It gave me unbelievable confidence, um, just in myself and uh, and mostly in my ability not to take a shower for six weeks. That's that was pretty impressive. It must have been pretty cool too. That I, I mean, the the difference between the traditional case officer job and what you're doing here is like you're seeing immediate results so quickly. You know, every yeah. night, every night you're going out and using the intel right. that you gather to go and police some jackass up. Uh, I, I can see, you know, why it's addictive for some people. Well, so frankly, that's the drug. It's, I mean, and that, that's what gets you on the. And so, this is not the CT mission. It's the, it's the war zone mission, but it's very similar. And so, you know, later on, when I did, um, you know, work, and I got to be careful when I say this, but when I did a lot of, lot of heavy kind of CT work. Where we where we had kind of unique missions um, as we're taking taking people off the battlefield. I mean, I tell you, you know, there's there just this is you know, I mean, you know, my my you know my my uh, uh, some of my my kind of civilian friends would think I'm kind of bloodthirsty, but there, I mean, it's a satisfying feeling. You know, yeah. you're killing America's enemies. It's uh, and it's hard to replicate that because as a case officer, think back what I talked to you about before about the oh, so we didn't really talk about the recruitment cycle to recruit somebody to spy for us can take up to a year. Mm -hmm. Here we are in, in war zones. The recruitment cycle is much quicker, um, and you're getting this this immediate satisfaction. Right. Uh, you know, I'll never. I, I remember one time in, in Baghdad, same you know, same group, uh, uh, and uh, and and I had some other kind of uh, you know sources on the ground. I remember, and the sources were really good. So they're like, hey, there's a group of Fedayeens, uh, 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 Saddam folks. That's that's that was kind of that was the Iraqi paramilitary arm of um, of, of Saddam Hussein. You know, hold up in this house, and here are the grid coordinates. And I remember going, got it, and I'm, I'm, I'm on the ground. Like, I got a phone call, and it's the ride. And I went, and I knocked on a fucking axe to a Bradley. And they pop it open. I'm like, here are these grid coordinates. And then, you know, 20 minutes later, I hear that, that, that sound that you all know of a Bradley, of that, of, that, of that gun going off. Done. That's hard to replicate, you know, as a case officer when you're at U.S. Embassy XYZ later on, and you have to do a long developmental cycle. You have to really switch that whole mentality. Sure. Um, uh, but but you know it's, it, these are these are kind of really unique experiences um, that uh, that you know that that I, I think I think made me a, kind of a stronger person gave me a lot more confidence um, wasn't great you know I mean there's there's I just on, on a personal level I'm like you know I, there was a lot of bad stuff I saw I, I, I had some serious I I, I I had some PTSD when I came back from that there was a lot of bad things that I saw and I was a little jacked up but um, uh, you know, it was a unique time. You're talking about like collateral damage and things like that that happened on the battlefield. There was there, there's a lot there's a lot and we killed a lot of people. I saw a lot of dead bodies. There was I remember when I came home, um, you know I left. Uh, I was there for half a year. I can't. I left. My son was four months old. I came back. He's ten months old. Doesn't recognize me at the airport. 
that was heartbreaking. And I just, I had nightmares of dead bodies nonstop. And it was, it's really, this is a really interesting story because my wife was, is at this point panicking. Like I was not well. One, there, we had a we had a legendary uh, uh, CIA officer. His name's out in the press now. Charlie Seidel, who was our who was our chief there, he passed away. He died of a heart attack uh, uh, last year. Um, Charlie had a house on Cape Cod, and so when we got back, he took that original team and all the families said, "Come stay with me for two weeks." And I was not well, and those two weeks was was incredible because two things happened. One is I kind of get my head straight. You're at the beach, it's beautiful. It's the summer in Cape Cod. Number two. I'm back with the boys and the girls, you know, so I'm back with my old team. And when you leave these experiences, it's hard. Yeah. Um, when you're sitting in Northern Virginia, sitting out back and you're thinking about, I, you know, I admit you miss all this stuff. It's really, it's really, it's, it's weird. And so, mm-hmm. but those two weeks with the team, but decompressing, I, that got my head straight. And so that was a, that was a, that was a little scary time for me, but, um, you know, but, but it, that goes back to that whole kind of concept of the camaraderie of our, of our, of our business. Speaking of some of the, um, the fallout from war. You had mentioned to me yeah. about the uh, the incident in Kaust, um, yeah. which I, again I don't know if you're you're allowed to say the the name of the place or not. But I, I've been there before. Sure. Uh, Fob Chapman in right. uh, Kaust Province, Afghanistan, and you mentioned that you you feel some sort of responsibility for sure. yeah. what had happened. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how that went down, what that incident was, and, and you know your I- I- involvement or or. Um, sure. Visibility. Some of it. I mean, I, I can say some of it. So you know, so so first and foremost, you know, just as as you know, your listeners, you know, will, 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 some of them will kind of know the story well. So everything I talk about now has actually been cleared for for release. I mean, Leon Panetta wrote a book, and he, he had a he had a he had a solid chapter on this. So, I, so when I talk about it, I take a lot of it in public. I take a lot of it from that. But you know, but but you know, so the like the the fifty thousand foot, the, the kind of the, the bottom line up front is, you know, you know, we were beat by Al Qaeda. Um, you know, we had what we thought was a was a really promising penetration um, with uh, with uh, 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 you know a sister Arab um, intelligence service, um, and he ended up being bad. And, and the end result, I was I was intimately involved in helping you know in the beginnings in running the case. I wasn't on the ground in coast, but I sent one of my officers there who was killed. Um, I, I was you know the, the the planning, everything involved in it, um, and ultimately you know seven of our, my colleagues were killed, and that was to me it was personally devastating. Um, you know, the, that was that was by far the worst kind of day of my life, you know, period. Uh, uh, and, you know, it certainly, you know, taught me a lot about humility. And I think I, I you know, I, I always talked about, you know, war zone service is really interesting because you come back and you walk a little taller because you did something important. Um, but it's also really important to have a sense of humility and, 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 and you know, never believing your own hype. And um, we got beat, you know, Al Qaeda ran a double agent at us. And so ultimately, um, you know, we put too much trust in someone. And I, I remember having discussions um, with, uh, uh, you know, with individuals at our headquarters. Would Al-Qaeda ever be able to do this, like the Chinese, the Russians? You know, the conventional wisdom was no. But, but ultimately, we trusted someone who we thought would get to the number two in Al-Qaeda, Ayman Zawahiri. Um, this, this asset candidate, agent candidate, was a, was a doctor. Um, and, uh, and he, he uh, you know, he, he has since had a, um, a very quick... Uh, uh, kind of jailhouse relationship recruitment with an with an Arab intel service, and we then kind of were involved in the case. And ultimately, um, because of all the things that he passed on, which was battle damage assessment from drone strikes, um, which was uh, uh, you know uh, some personal information or, or, or clearly insinuation that he could get close to some of the senior leadership of Al Qaeda. Um, we knew Ayman Zawahiri was sick. This guy was a doctor. We had we had some some. Certainly, some ideas that we he might be get close to Zawahiri, but but we thought we had to meet him, and so um, the meeting arrangements, you know, kind of uh, 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 moved over time. But ultimately, it was going to be in, in coast Afghanistan, which you know is uh, you know it's it's Bob Chapman. It's a you know it's a it's a it's a a place. It's a stronghold of the Haqqani network um, right across the border in Pakistan, Miram Shah. But it's you know it's it's a it's a legendary place in CIA lore for for a lot of reasons. Um, one of our first kind of, uh, or, or one of our biggest kind of counterterrorism pursuit teams located there. Um, but ultimately, uh, that was the, the meeting location. And, and at the end, um, unfortunately, and you never know what happened. And, you know, and I, I take as much responsibility as anybody, but this, the, the meeting arrangements that, that this, the leadership of the base and others, um, you know, uh, that we thought were in place, uh, they, 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 for whatever reason, kind of, um, uh, kind of stood down on them. And so, 
ultimately this this individual was a suicide bomber and and uh, and he detonated uh, 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 you know his improvised explosive vest and, and killed seven of, of our officers, including my friends. And so, you know, as someone who had been um, intimately involved in the operation, I, I was on the live feed when this occurred. Um, it was an ISR feed. Uh, uh, all of a sudden, something goes really wrong. Uh, I remember, you know, this is, and again, the, the, it was, I mean, it's, it's out in the press now, the, the CI case officer it was, a, it was a phenomenal officer named Darren Labonte, um, someone who I considered to be, you know, I loved him. He was superhuman. This is someone who was an FBI agent, U.S. Marshal. He was an Army Ranger, and he was a cop. He did everything before. I would joke with him and said, you can't hold down a job. But he was the most <laughs> badass dude I've ever met in my life. Um, uh, uh, did, did previous service uh, in, in Afghanistan as well at one of our bases, um, and uh, and and standing up, you know, when and when this happened, you know, I remember getting, a, you know, something clearly was wrong, and I I finally got a phone call from from our station chief in Kabul, who's one of our kind of legendary officers, um, and again, this taught me so much. And he said, he said, Mark, you know, look, uh, uh, you got to sit down right now; they're all gone. Um, and, uh, and, and you're going to have to get up in front of 400 of your, you know, the people you lead in this other, in this, in this office, everybody who knows and, and loves Darren, um, and tell him what happened. They said, look, there's going to be a time for you to grieve and figure out what happened, but you know, you need to stand up and lead. And I remember that, that calling that all hands, um, was the, I, I don't really remember even what happened. It was the hardest experience of my life and, and people dropping in their knees and crying. And, um, it was, it was truly, truly awful. Uh, uh, and, and so, you know, I feel an enormous sense of responsibility to that. I, I, you know, I remember when I was promoted to the senior intelligence service, sitting in the ceremony in our bubble at headquarters, thinking I don't deserve this. Um, and, uh, but you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, the only thing I'll say on this is, uh, you know, I have tremendous, you know, sadness and regret. I know the Labani family very well. I still visit them in, in Florida. I remember, uh, years later talking to, he's there, he's our current ambassador in Saudi Arabia. He was the, at the time, the deputy commander of CENTCOM, John Abizade, uh, you know, very well known. Uh, three or four star uh, uh, army officer, army general, um, and I was telling him about my feelings. What happened? And he said, "Mark, you know, you know, you're going to have to deal with this." And he said, "Just think about what I do. You're, you, you know, seventy of your friends were killed." He goes, "I do this on an industrial scale, as a, as the deputy of CENTCOM." And so, yeah, I mean, it was it was a, it was a terrible moment. I learned a ton. I I have an enormous sense of humility. Um, never believed my hype ever again after that. And, uh, and I, I tell that story a lot just because, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of lessons learned from that. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, and that spurred me then to go on to Afghanistan where I, I kind of had a lot of anger and, and we wrecked a lot of vengeance. Um, after that, I went back for it for a year after that immediately, um, when I was, when I was done with that Middle Eastern post. So Mark, you were watching a live feed. So th this was an attempt to recruit an, an Al Qaeda insider. This would have been a huge, huge intelligence recruitment for the CIA. Right. This would, and th this effort, this attempted recruitment, would, would have been classified as a covert operation. So you're there watching the live feed from the drone. It's what you're describing to me. Well, it was. It was. It, you know, it was. A, it was an ISR feed. Um, where where we were not going to watch the meeting um it, we watched the movement of the right. individual to the base and so we knew it was going on and now i'm just on a chat i'm on a secure chat I with see. the base and nobody's answering me and nobody's wow. answering me and i'm thinking something's not right and there are people behind me who knew darren well and i look behind i'm like everybody out of my office and, and because people started getting worried and then i mean you know it, it was all it was it was it was gut-wrenching it was terrible to the point where um I mean, I remember after that, it was, it was, I didn't eat or sleep for 48 hours. I ended up, and this is, this is nothing compared to others who never came back, but I ended up getting a freaking kidney stone. I passed out um, and had to be hospitalized uh, uh, with a kidney stone because for 48 hours, I didn't eat or drink after that because we were so, you know, consumed with, with, with uh, what it occurred. Yeah. So, uh, but, but, you know, but, you know, when, when you, there's, there, and, and you all know this. There's times in your in your life when you know something's wrong. You get that whether it's your hair stands up or you get that sick feeling. That was a bad feeling, um, and uh, and and you know it's uh, you know there's a lot of lessons learned that have gone into kind of uh, uh, kind of the agency playbook for operations, which is really important. Um, uh, and so you know you hope some good comes of it, but you can never bring those those uh, those folks back. And so you know. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I remember, you know, the, our, our base chief, um, Jennifer Matthews, again, it's out in the press quite a bit. Um, uh, I remember, you know, that day talking to her, I mean, just, you know, really, really stuff that I'll, that I'll never forget. And then 
you know, everybody, just like everybody else, I was very interested in the movie Zero Dark Thirty, and they have that whole scene, um, which was excruciating for me to watch. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, when, I, I don't even know if it's accurate or not, because they're all gone. Um, but, uh, uh, but probably has some element of truth in that, so that was, that was tough. But Mark, why, why did I? Knew, I could never really figure out why did Zero Dark Thirty incorporate that incident in Bob Chapman? It had nothing to do with the hunt for Bin Laden, as, as I understand it. Well, I think I think it's just it's the story behind the agency efforts, and and mm-hmm. the, and and you know so so ultimately, you know I have some really good friends. I I, I you know I would go in and out of the hunt for Al Qaeda to be honest. Um, over that period between 9/11 and when Bin Laden was ultimately killed, but even afterwards, and, and, and you know, uh, 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 after that, um, there are, there are individuals I knew who, who were involved for you know nine, ten straight years. That's all they did. They worked in our counterterrorism center. They rotated in the TDY circuit between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, uh, you know, they, to me, they are total heroes in this because uh, you know they have encyclopedic knowledge of uh, of uh, 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 of the target. So I think it was the Zero Dark Thirty was just a story of that uh, of that commitment. And I, you know, it's funny because one of my really good friends, um, who was uh, was you know he's he's still in, he's a station chief now. But I remember sitting with him, you know, at the at the local dive bar here, at the BNN. We're talking about this, um, and uh, and he said he said nine years. You know, they, 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 they it was it was nine years and a lot and, and a lot of uh, colleagues unfortunately were killed. And by the way, this this does, you know so you know we're focused on on of course what happened in coast, but there's a lot of ground branch officers who paid the ultimate price as well. And so um, you know you can't you can't forget that uh, you know, Afghanistan was a is a very unforgiving place. So so the agency's given a lot there. Can you tell us then about afterwards a- after that event where you were back in Langley sure. and now you volunteered to go to Shkin. And, right. and get into the shit. So, so I came back um, again. You know, it's a, there's a there's a there's a uh, a theme here. So I came back. You know, obviously really shaken by this, and I walked into our personnel office, and, and uh, this is after I'd left that you know service in in the in the, in, in the Levant, another Middle Eastern country. And I said, obviously I was upset about what happened. I said, send me to the worst place on the planet. And they're like, we got it for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I said, where is it? And they said. It's a uh, it's a uh, Shkin Afghanistan. I said sign me up, and so you know Shkin was a legendary place in agency lore. Three three Grand Branch officers uh, have been killed there. Um, it was the first the, the first CTPT uh, after nine eleven was uh, was created in Shkin. I mean, there's great the pictures of these guys and team. sandals and and you know FDNY and, and NYPD hats. Um, there's been so there's others obviously others killed there's 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 Navy SEAL there uh, killed and then there were some terrible incidents of of, of uh, there was a U.S. military uh, shit it was a, a, a helicopter that was that was that was uh, shot shot down there um, uh, and so you know uh, it, but it was it was a, it was a really interesting place it is it is um, ten kilometers six mi- six miles it's in Patika Patika province it's right across the border from Pakistan um, it is uh, it is the, it's probably the farthest end of the earth you could ever imagine. Um, and it's and it's a place where you know so it, it, you know it, it's it was not an Al Qaeda strong, you know stronghold I think you know it was it was more of Taliban there was a group there called the Commander Nazir group that you both might be familiar with which is you know uh, in essence a Taliban group um, responsible for the deaths of a lot of Americans and so it was it was a really unforgiving place and it was you know to get there you'd have to take you know, obviously that's the you know it's a flight to Kabul and then it's a uh, you know from Kabul um, uh, you'd have to get to, to uh, you know with a C one thirty to uh, to coast, and then from coast, you, you take the Hilo into Shkin, which runs every two once every two weeks because the weather's so crappy. Which means you're stranded there all the time. You're either stranded at coast, and I was joking with you all before, and, and talking to others, some of your some of the folks probably uh, uh, watching today. Coast base was a is a it was a shithole of staggering proportions. Um, if you and, and I think you know maybe you all have both been, both been there. The, the the transient TDY place where we'd sit around wait for the helo was like infested with bed bugs. It was it was a I was a it, harsh it, it wasn't so bugs. bad by the time I got there uh, oh. at, at uh, Faba Salerno. Okay, uh, because this place was was gruesome. Now, but again, you know, the, you know we were sitting around the fire pit, incredible, incredible camaraderie. Um, but uh, uh, but then you know you, you got to go through this mountain pass in Patika and you end up at Shkin and you are at the end of the, the end of the earth. And that was, to me, the happiest year of my life. And number one is I was able to kind of, you know, seek vengeance for what happened. Um, maybe not, maybe, maybe our, our shrink should have let me out there, but, but they did. Um, I had a, uh, an incredible cadre of regular case officers and paramilitary officers 
Um, one of the one of the things that 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 and and you know I, I would get like there's no way if I had this conversation and I was you know like, going out again they would ever let me go out again because one of the proudest things that happened I was back in coast and it actually he's the, he's, the, he's the current head of our special activities division now or special activities center but he was the base chief of coast he looked at me he said Mark you're running a freaking cult there the the people at, you know skin was so, we were so tight um uh and 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 so because when i got there i i said the following i said look everybody here's mission is one thing and they knew i came from the whole mess and coast i said we're going to kill as many people as possible lawfully um but but you know so we're going to wreck vengeance and and there are um there are there are there are things that you have to do in terms of uh of of what do you call it uh winning hearts and minds we call it covert influence um there's a lot of of nation building we had to do i did that but my officers knew i didn't care about that we were we were on a we were on a, on a mission there because of what had happened and so it was a unique time where everybody was was you know was so much i'd have i'd have the damn like we so again there's so many great stories you know our, our, our cooks we had a macedonian cook this guy's not cleared at all he's probably a freaking russian agent when we when we'd have a, when we'd have a successful operation, I'd bring him into the all hands and he'd giving him high fives too. Because by the way, agency food in the war zones is great, and so so this dude this dude deserved it too. So we had just this incredible tight knit unit, um, uh, and and you know there's I think the highlight was you know there was there was uh, several ground branch officers who'd been killed there over the years. There was one high value target we were going after who we knew was directly responsible for for the death of of, of, of one of them. Um, and that was my mission. I could care less about anything else. And so we recruited agents across the way in Af in, in Pakistan again, right across the border, uh, across the border control post. Um, and uh, and jeez, uh, uh, I don't remember the, the the month it was, but but we you know we obviously put them on the X. We called in a strike, and and we killed this individual who's responsible for killing a lot of Americans, but directly responsible for killing a CIA officer. And, uh, and that feeling, as we kind of sat down around the fire pit, I always called the fire pit, and you all know this, is Caveman TV. Mm -hmm. um, there was nothing better than sitting around that fire pit every night. And I love that because I'm with all my, all the officers. And I, and I say, when I say the boys and the gals, you know, there was, there was you know, we had, we had uh, certainly male and female officers all together. But that was, that was the time where we spent, we spent the, these times together. And, and I remember, you know, we kind of made it, you know, we had a toast. And one of the ground branch guys said, you know what? Let's make a call to Fort Bragg, North Carolina right now. And we call this officer's widow. And boy, would I gotten a lot of shit for doing this. We called her and we told her, hey, we, we just avenged the death of your husband. <laughs> Jesus. And, so, and so we sat back that night and there was, there was some tears. Um, I must have had I have 500 messages from all over, all over the world. Uh, uh, a lot from kind of the paramilitary arm, but others from just, hey, that's what we do. Um, and it was awesome. And uh, and I remember thinking, uh, you know, we can we can pack up and go home now, but we didn't. And uh, but you know, and, but those those deployments, um, and you both know this, you know, it's the sense of brotherhood and and sisterhood that is just something you can't even imagine. And we we're talking before the show. I'll just I I, I'll, I promise you, uh, you never talk politics, but you know, <clears throat> uh, uh, there are people in from my group, from my team there, who are completely different. Politically, you know, their, their ideology, they, they you know, uh, I think they probably have the, like a, their, their arsenals, that they have like a bunker in Montana that they're, uh, they're getting ready for Armageddon. I could care less because I know right now they'd have my back and they always will. Right. Um, and, and, I, and I love these folks. And literally today I was at the Vienna Inn. I will tell you, I'm sitting at the Vienna Inn. It's the dive bar. I'm with my buddy who's a B-1 pilot in the, in the, in the Air Force. And, and he flew missions over us. We always joke about this. And I'll tell you one thing, a show of force from a B-1 is a, is a, is a mighty righteous <laughs> thing. Um, but someone tapped me on the back and, uh, it was an officer from, from, this is 2020. This was from eight years ago who was, who was back from, from something else. And he said, Hey Mark, I couldn't believe he was there. And, and you know, that's the kind of camaraderie that you have. Um, and, and you can, you can really never, never replace that. And so that year was just incredible for me. It is, it is at the end of the earth. It is a nasty place. It is unforgiving. Uh, I go out, you know, so, so again, I'm, I'm the base chief. I have the paramilitary uh, officers with me. I have a chief paramilitary um, officer who's in charge of, uh, uh, of, of ground branch. Every once in a while, I've got to go out, you know, and roll with the boys. And I know what they did. I'm like, hey, hey, on Wednesday, I want to go out. With you. And I'm like, and they're like, ah, shit, like, we'll scrap that mission. Like, let's just take them around for a fucking drive so we don't get killed. <laughs> and, and, well, you know, and, but, and I know they're doing that, but I wanted to go out with them. 
Um, and there's nothing better when we're out at one of our kind of, you know, four remote bases right up the border with Pakistan. We're, we're sleeping overnight there. There's shitty bed bugs. Um, and, you know, you just, it, that, that, that's an unforgettable feeling. And, and, and I'll tell you, you know, it, it, the, the part of that that was what that I'm missing that I, that I haven't said is Time Magazine at one point called Skin the most dangerous place on the planet. We took IDF every morning. Every morning, Al Qaeda would rocket us. It was, I, 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 you know, I threw out my, my watch. Um, uh, we, we had IDF every single goddamn morning. If to go running around, you got to, you got to hug the Hescos. It was insane. Um, we lost two of our, uh, of our indigenous commanders there. We were both killed. Um, legendary, uh, uh, in kind of in, in Afghan lore. Um, no, you know, we didn't have many Americans there. There's only about 20 of us, which is again, extraordinary 20 Americans for a year, uh, several hundred of the indigenous. And then, and, and so, you know, you have this uh, uh, incredibly dangerous environment, but I would also say that unlike when you saw these, these kind of green on blue attacks, when you had, you know, there, there's been a terrible rash in, over the years of, of Afghan military kind of turning on, on conventional U.S. military forces, man, in skin, like we live with these guys. Uh, we ate with them every night. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, there was, uh, I ate a lot of kind of nasty ass stew. <laughs> I don't know what the hell I was eating. Goat. <clears throat> we 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 had a, we had a tradition there. We take a shot of bourbon before we go eat with them, because um, we we were hoping it would kill whatever was going to go in us. But I, I love these guys, and and there's no doubt in my mind that they saved our lives all the time. The uh, you know our, our indigenous partners, and so again, it's a it's a remarkable uh, kind of year of my life that I will I will never forget. I will always cherish. And I remember, uh, uh, you know, and I will tell you one thing: when you when you you fly into a place like that, there's no daytime helo insertion. It's everything's at night because you're getting IDF all the time. So, so that was one of those times where I'm flying in, and it's a great friend of mine now. He's retired, Mick Mulroy. You know, he's a, he's a big guy in ABC now. I love Mick. He's a ground branch officer. He became station chief all over, all over Africa. Um, he's a big dog now, kind of in the media. But I remember I took over for him, and I remember flying in there. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the first, our first attempt, there's, there's IDF, and then we finally get in the ground. And, you know, you don't walk between the, 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 the LZ and, 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 the, and, the, and the skiff, you, you, got, you got to get there quick because it's dangerous. Um, and I remember, that was one of those times of scratching my head again, like, I did it again, volunteering for this crazy stuff. <laughs> Here we go again, but what an amazing year. And I remember when that, that helo lifted off and I, and, and I left that place. I mean, I had tears in my eyes because I, I, lo I loved that place. I loved everybody who served there, and uh, uh, it, was, it was pretty remarkable. Mark, there was... Uh you know, I know things are got haywire in our country right now, and normally, you know, Dave and I don't get into political stuff. There was one question I'll ask you at the end, though, since you had mentioned it to me um, sure. about you know, about your colleagues um, speaking out about some of the things going on recently. But before right, we right. get there, I wanted to ask you about this entire episode in Moscow. Um, yeah, sure. We're totally sure. changing gears here. This is—I um, I, I don't want to insert too much or editorialize too much. I'd rather just let's just hear it from you. What happened in Moscow? What were you doing there? How did how did things go down? So 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 after all this kind of craziness, I came back and then you know my life got much less got, got much more dull. Mm -hmm. I you know I, I I got you know I got promoted. I had some headquarters jobs. Um, you know my kids got older, and so you know my my you know my my daughter and my son who you know kind of loved living all over the Middle East. They wanted to come back to America, so. Uh, took a break from overseas stuff, so I was the deputy ops chief for the Middle East at the, for, for a time, and then I then when I re when I re uh, received promotion to the senior intelligence service, um, our DDO at the time, our operations chief for the whole agency, um, basically was like, "Look, we have to, we need you to do something different." And at the time, this was when you know the Russians kind of frankly kicked our ass in terms of the, the election interference in 2016, and whatever you, it, 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 this has nothing to do with whether you think it affected the election, but the Russians were screwing with us. And so what they did is they brought a whole bunch of former CT folks like myself or Middle Eastern folks and put it, put, put us into positions where we could kind of push back against the Russians. So I did not have any Russian experience, but um, uh, I started off as the deputy operations chief overseeing Europe and Eurasia, which is, you know, 2000 plus officers in 50 countries. And, but really it was, it was, you know, Russia, Europe, you know, Russia, Ukraine, Turkey, which of course is easy and like, has nothing to do with the news and, you know, um, I thought I thought I was going to be like like TDY and going on like temporary trips like Paris and Berlin. I never did that. Um, and so so our job was to push back against the Russians, and we did so successfully. And, and as part of that, I you know at one point I uh, you know I, I I made a trip out to to Moscow in December 2017. I wanted to see Ambassador Huntsman. He is a he is a legendary ambassador 
Uh, he was ambassador in Beijing, ambassador in uh, in Moscow. You know, big Republican political guy. He was the governor, I think, in Utah. Um, ran for president, uh, but a wonderful guy. So I wanted to talk to him about kind of get his views. And I needed, I needed, frankly, an area fam trip. Um, so I spent ten days in, in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And, and and you know, like I, you know, I, I've, I, you know, obviously, there's a whole lot to talk about in this. Um, this is something that. Uh, my going public on this was really uncomfortable for me, but but it, you know it had to be done based on kind of some medical issues. But but ultimately, and I you know it, I and I think um, you know some people might sound sound like we're we're kind of getting a little nutty or not. But like, there was a whole issue with with officers who had been affected um, by by uh, really mysterious illnesses in Havana. Um, uh, and so so I'm in Moscow. It's you know it's December I think fifth of 2017. You know, uh, uh, at a hotel near the embassy, and you know, we had, of course, heavy surveillance. The Russians didn't want me there; they were really suspicious. Our the, the talks we had with them were awful. Um, they accused me of all sorts of crazy shit. What am I? What are you doing here, spying on us? And I'm like, I'm a freaking SIS officer. Like, I haven't run a fucking SDR in years. I'm not spying on anybody. I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to get some dinner at, at the at the you know Pushkin Cafe in uh, in Moscow, and then meeting with you. But it was very hostile relationship was terrible and so look in the middle of the night i you know i had this event that happened and, and just i mean i you know I, uh, it, it, it is what it is and and you know with, with incredible vertigo and nausea and something happened to me where where i had this you know tinnitus and 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 it turned into this kind of years of 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 medical issues um and right, so ultimately back, back, you know, back up, Mark, there's, there's, describe there's, exactly yeah. like what happened to you what did you experience sure. middle of the night i was awoken with a start um, I had incredible vertigo. You know, this is this is not being able to even stand up. I was falling over, uh, ringing in my ears. Um, incredible nausea. I thought I was going to vomit. Uh, uh, I was, you know, and, and and all I can tell you is after having you know shrapnel whiz by my head and all the crazy shit I did in the Middle East, I was terrified. Moscow would happen. Um, uh, and uh, you know, by the next morning, it subsided a little bit. Um, I made it through the trip and then I, then I came home and it started this journey. Uh, you know, I, I missed four months of work. Um, and ultimately by July of 2019, I couldn't even get through a, a full, you know, eight hour day. Uh, and I had to retire and I could retire at 50. Wow. Uh, but I, but I had to retire, but you know, so I, I, I've been through to numerous medical doctors. I have gone through programs at NIH, you know, fortunately after, after some of this press that's come out, I'm going to get to go to Walter Reed. Uh, which is that? And Walter Reed is the is the is the gold standard of TBI, traumatic brain injury treatment. Um, I'll probably be there with a lot of folks I might have known in the past. In fact, um, and so so look. So ultimately, uh, uh, it was an event that happened. And, and the fact of the matter is, there's 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 40 plus U.S. government officials who have had similar events, whether they're in Havana or China, and now it's happening again. Um, and and look, I love the agency. I have dear friends in that place, but our, our Office of Medical Services, our medical staff, is is abysmal. Um, it's it's like the NFL was 15 years ago with TBI. It's probably like the U.S. military DOD was with uh, Gulf War Syndrome um, in the beginning. So something mm -hmm. is happening to our folks. Uh, you know, some people can, can can say that, you know, I sound like a kook. All I can say is, you know, I retired as an SIS-4 who probably was going to be on the seventh floor very quickly. Um, I have a, a great, you know, track record in terms of operations, um, you know, and, and leadership and mentoring. There's no reason for me to, you know, say any of this stuff other than something really bad happened. And I think the agency owes us the proper, proper medical care in terms of culpability. That's a whole separate issue. I think there's an article in, in GQ, which was accurate. There is, there is a strong circumstantial case that, you know, using techniques such as geofencing, which this is, you know, the New York times had a, had a great article on this. In terms of what it means, it's buying ad data where you can where you can track cell phones. And so there's, you know, in some of these cases where this happened, there was Russian intel officers in the vicinity. So it's an interesting circumstantial case. So clearly there has to be more done. Um, people always ask me, you know, are the Russians capable of doing this? The answer is, of course, look what they're doing across Europe now with their assassination campaigns. I mean, there's, you know, the, you know, Vladimir Putin is, is, is there's, there's no constraint on his behavior. Um, but, but I don't know if it's them. Um, the, the, you know, kind of for me, it was it was just kind of drawing attention to the, the 40 plus officers who have been um, hit in Havana and a couple of us who have kind of who this has happened to recently. And uh, and, uh, and all I can say is that going public with uh, this was incredibly difficult and stressful. And you know, look, look, ultimately, I have I have I have a migraine headache 24 seven. It's for three years. Um, it's not it doesn't stop me from having this conversation right now, um, but it's chronic pain. Right. Um, and uh, and uh, and again, I, I equate it to the NFL and TBI, and 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 
you know, as I just, you know, I, I see a lot of world-class doctors. I was just at NIH for a week, and I, I remember I went, I talked to one of the doctors. I said, look, um, you know, it's going to take a while to figure out what's, what's going on here. The National Academy of Sciences, NIH, Walter Reed, all believe something occurred, and the medical community is kind of coming to consensus. But I said to them, I said, look, I can do a couple things. I can have a couple pops of bourbon like I'm having now, which is really not healthy. Uh, but I said, but I got my medical marijuana card. <laughs> so uh, it's, 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 uh, it's now legal in, uh, in Virginia. And, 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 I, and I joke around on this, but the bottom line is there's a lot of people suffering from chronic pain. And, uh, and that's um, not new to the DOD community uh, at all. I think when I go to Walter Reed, I'm going to be with a lot of former you know, uh, uh, folks from Virginia Beach and from Fort Bragg. Um, this is what I'm told. Uh, but it's new to the agency community, and uh, and uh, you know it, it's uh, it, it's something we just got to take care of. And Mark, just to talk, try to unpack all of this a little bit because this is such a sure. um, bizarre, but but honestly, a fascinating story. The the Russians have been fucking around with novel weapon systems going back Absolutely. to the nineteen fifties or sixties, right. and have continued yeah. that development on lasers, masers they were called at one point, yeah. microwave weapons, acoustic weapons. Um, they were very interested in the field of psychotronics or psychoenergenics, ways of fucking with the human mind, essentially mind control, like, like the CIA was at, at one point in the 1950s. Sure. Yeah. There, 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 there were these uh, organizations were very interested in these things. Some people have pointed out that a, a microwave weapon takes up, it's like the size of a tractor trailer. The issue with these weapons have always been that they're, the, the, the batteries are huge. Um, we don't know if you got it hit with a microwave weapon or some other right. type of weapon. And no one really knows as far as I, uh, my, my sources have told me and, and what I read in, in the press. Right. But maybe if it was just you, we could say, okay, Mark's got some screws loose. Something wrong with this guy. But it's not right. just you. You have people across no. the Central Intelligence Agency and the State Department who are reporting right. similar symptoms. Like there is clearly something going on, although we don't right. know exactly what that something is. Yeah. So, so, Jack, you're 100 percent right. Look, I, so as I as I've come out in the press on this, which again was quite odd, mm -hmm. um, and I think there's certainly some people probably in the senior leadership of the agency not happy with me, but. But ultimately, um, I've talked to a lot of these people. That the Havana cohort, I mean, it's it's terrible. I mean, there's there's some there's some folks who are seriously way in worse shape than I am. Um, there is, uh, uh, you know, whether they went to the University of Pennsylvania or University of Miami or NIH or to Walter Reed, there is medical evidence. And then the National Academy of Sciences is, is has a study that is about to come out, which is unfortunately is, is hasn't been released yet. You know. Um, uh, Dr. Dave Relman, who kind of ran the whole thing, I've talked to him a million times. He's pissed. He's talking about it in public. Something happened, mm -hmm. um, and so you know. So what you know? What is it? Okay. Well, there's a couple things. So first of all, we have developed you know weapons like this. I don't believe we've used it, but certainly the U.S. military has experimented with these things. It's not unheard of. Uh, and and again, and number two, if you talk to people, you know, my old friends. I was not a Russia expert, but but people I know who served in Moscow in the old days, you know, that spy dust is toxic. Uh, you know, I have friends who who that there's been there's been a rash of serious illnesses that have happened to agency officers who have served in, in Moscow over the years, and so, you know, the, this this is the agency's Agent Orange or 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 just like you know the NFL's TBI. Um, it's something that they have to come come to grips with. Now, now I will say that the senior most levels of the of our operations director completely believe this. Um, the medical staff at CIA doesn't, and that's that to me is is uh, is really wrong. I think there's. Uh, which is what kind of spurred me to to kind of uh, 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 come forward and, and go public on it, um, but uh, uh, but but uh, you know we have to figure out what happened here, and and I think we can. The way I always equated it is if there was a count. So if I was a CIA officer going out to uh, uh, Bucharest, and I knew that an Al Qaeda hit team was going to come out and try to kill me, we would put heaven and earth. We would put you know, 40 officers on the street. We'd have counter surveillance. We'd have all sorts. Of, we'd have JSOC coming in. We'd have liaison coming in. We need to have that same kind of focus for what's happening here, and, and that's what I'd like to see. Um, I think we'll get there. I think there's a lot of people within the operations directorate um, who believe in this. I know, and again, it's been out in the press. This, this has been briefed to our director. It's been briefed to the National Security Council. I think, you know, under a, uh, a new administration, um, this is not a political statement. I think it'll be taken uh, 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 more seriously. 
Um, uh, but really, for, for me, it's just getting the getting the folks the medical attention that is uh, that is deserved because something happened. And and but but you know, ultimately, you're right. I mean, the way to also reverse engineer this is we have to find out what it was. Right. Um, you know, and so look, like at one point, I thought uh, just uh, this has been a three year journey for me. I thought it was a SIGINT collection thing just juiced up, and they just freaking fried me. I mean. You all remember we had Scooby vans running over. Every, you know, a Scooby van is a yeah, yeah. is a van with SIG and gear. You run around and you try to, you know, find the phones of a bad guy, and then there's a there's a team that goes in and 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 and, and picks them up. Um, I always thought it was something like that. Uh, it turns out it might not be. It might be something else. Mark, I was wondering if you know, based on your your experience in the intelligence community and having directly experienced one of these events, whatever it is, sure. if you could speak a little bit to the the motivation behind it. Uh, sure. What would be the motivation to attack uh, our officers in Cuba, in Beijing, in Moscow? Why? Why, why would these attacks be taking place? Well, so, so, so to me, this is easy. I mean, I, I, that, that's kind of the easiest part in terms of just my analysis. Because what do you want to do? As, as you know, so you know, you, you know, obviously, you know, killing an officer is one thing, but but the, the kind of incapacitating an officer right. um, is something that is of uh, you know. So look, and you could do that. You could do that by sending you know ten walk-ins. You send ten walk-ins to an embassy, and agency case officers are have taken up you know you know five thousand man hours or you know yeah. of their time. It's it's that same thing. So this is this is doing something that's going to harm somebody. That's going to take them offline from their jobs. Um, that to me is is uh, uh, is uh, is kind of the the uh, kind of the motivation of this. Um, also- and with 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 uh, with kind of the, the added component of kind of the non attribution. I mean, this is a little odd. Right, you know, yeah. we can't figure out what's going on. That the the. the According to the press, and I got to be very careful on this because I have to honor my secrecy agreement. But if you read the, the New York Times article and the GQ article, the agency concluded that there, you know, via geofencing techniques, there were Russian intel officers in the vicinity of some of these th- attacks. Mm-hmm. That is interesting. Very, interesting. you know, and this is this is not Russian intel intel officers in Moscow. This is this is attacks that happened in third countries where we saw serious movement and travel. Um, so you know that's you know so it's 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 uh, but I, I wish they would attack the problem like they would have if it was an Al Qaeda cell that was operating against our uh, our officers and you know what um, yeah, it's hard talking about this because you know I don't know if I was on the other end I think these guys were these people are all nuts I'll say but but I think you're 100 percent right it's not just me um, talking to the Havana the officers affected in Havana is heartbreaking they they are they have serious issues that have caused them to retire whether it's state commerce or the agency. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and that's really sad. And so, you know, I, I would hope that it's taken seriously, um, uh, you know, in the future. I, I think that comparison to the Gulf War syndrome or agent orange is, is pretty <coughs> in, the, in the sense that those are instances where our government was like, deny, 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 right. cover up, deny, deny. And meanwhile, all these folks keep getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, it's better to just pull the band aid off. And for the CIA and the DCI and DNI and whoever else is involved to just pull that Band-Aid off, be like, let's get the let's get the people the help that they need, rather than playing well, this whole game. That, so, so you know, it's it's funny because I have friends you know across the political spectrum on this. So there's you know there's certainly the, the, I, uh, and I, there, the outpouring was amazing. I had you know three former directors kind of contact me and, and kind of because I because I knew them. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the difference in me is only that I was just really senior and, that, that, and this happened. I mean, that's, that's why I feel a sense of responsibility for everyone else. But the other piece is that, uh, you know, it, this is not ideological, you know, uh, you know, mm-hmm. a, 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 a friend of mine, I guess, I don't know, I want to name him, but you know, he's a Fox news commentator, a former agency, you know, he called me and he said, okay, like, what is this thing? And I said, look, the only thing that matters, let's forget that. Let's forget the complicity angle. Cause everyone goes crazy when you say Russia, just get our people treatment. That's it, you know. So if, if they got to go to Walter Reed, sign the damn memo and get them to Walter Reed. Right. Um, and I think that that is that is very similar to Gulf Gulf War syndrome or TBI with the NFL. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, what if, the, what I always describe and what I always told my junior officers and, and what upsets me now is that you know you make a pact. This is a weird job that we have, and it, and it's the same thing in the special operations community as a, as with the agency. So we are tasked to do the impossible. We are tasked to, to kind of go way out in the limb. It's going to be legal what we do, but it's out there, and you always have to know that your your you know your your superiors, your you know the people in your command um, have your back because mm-hmm. uh, bad stuff happens. 
Right. And so ultimately, that's where I think this has been violated a little bit. Because I always did that. I knew that, you know, uh, you know, if, if, if bad shit happened. I'll, I'll never forget a, a story where we were conducting a counterterrorism mission. I was back at headquarters. Things went bad. And I had to go in front of the, the you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the deputy director of the CIA. Um, and so I, so I was trying to prepare myself for this. And I, and I walked in there. I said, okay, so this happened. We, you know, we, there was, we, we conducted a, a strike. Um, you know, uh, it was a counterterrorism mission. Something went wrong. There was some collateral damage. This thing happens. And let me tell you something. This is, this is on me. And these are the three things that we did to kind of fix that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now, I knew that the, the, the agency leadership is going to get an, uh, just an ass chewing from the White House. Because whether it's our intel support to the military, whatever it was, something went wrong. The political folks are going to be pissed. But, but, but as, as I gave this briefing... And at the end of it, and, and I asked, you know, any questions, I said no, and I walked out. And, uh, and afterwards, um, there was, you know, there was certainly dissatisfaction that we had done something that, that didn't go well, but they had my back. Right. And when the White House called and said, what the hell? They said, you know what? Shit happens. We fixed it. Sorry. You know, no, one, no one got killed. There was some, there was, you know, there was some people injured in, in, in something that happened. Um, but, I, but my agency leadership had my back. They could have hung me out to dry. And I was, I was you know, senior officer. I was an SIS officer at the time. Um, and so that, that kind of goes into the same thing here is that you, you have to have a pact with people, um, in order them to do hard stuff. Why would anyone go to Moscow or to Afghanistan or to Yemen or Syria? If your leadership is not going to take care of you both politically, but also on the medical front, that's really right. important. And, right. uh, and so that's where, that's where I think this has failed. I, I look, I, I'm also I'm always an eternal optimist. I think this will be fixed. Yeah. Just a couple of quick comments from people, uh, viewers. Sure. Uh, Graham says, thanks for the pod, as always, and most importantly, thanks to Mark and our chat spy for, our, uh, for your service. Good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Kevin says, thanks. love Mark. Hate that he is no longer with the U.S. government. We would be so much better with him. Um, and thank you, Kevin, for a very generous time. Appreciate it. I, you know, I, I think, you know, Again, we don't normally get into like the partisan politics and things like that on the show. Sure. Um, but you brought it up, and I, I think considering everything that's going on in America right now with the election and everything, maybe it's sort of apropos uh, a topic. Um, one of the things you had mentioned to me was speaking towards why so many of your agency colleagues are kind of coming out in a very political way that I don't think we've seen from former agency people right, in the right. past. They're yeah. being very vocal about how they feel. Um, well, what's your take on that? What are your thoughts on that? Boy, so, oh, God. So, so there's, there's, there's a couple things on this. One is, I think that, um, uh, how can I say this? Because I, 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 cause I can't be a hypocrite on this. I've been extremely vocal in the media mm -hmm. um, about my views on, on the, you know, the, I don't know, the current, previous, whatever you want to call it, administration. I try to I try to keep that um, uh, in terms of uh, kind of intel intelligence and foreign policy matters, but clearly that old tradition and history of former military, former intelligence, former special operations folks not commenting is way that 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 <laughs> out the that, window. That, yeah. that, that ship has sailed in a yeah, big right. way. Right. Um, I think it's because it was, this is such a unique president uh, and, and administration, and so I think you know uh, uh, you know. When I left, I remember I, I went to see a former um, uh, a director, and I said, look, I, I think there, I have a lot to offer and talk about intelligence matters. I didn't think it would get into political stuff, but, but there's a lot that we can say in terms of explaining the intelligence community and what happens. Mm -hmm. um, on a personal note, you know, and, and, you know, and, and you can, you can, one can agree with me or not, um, I was so disturbed about a lot of the things I saw. I think Lafayette Square, the events at Lafayette Square Park really bothered me. Um, and so, so I was really outspoken on that. Uh, it would be nice, and I'd be, I'm, and of course, I'll be called a hypocrite uh, because uh, 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 you know, obviously, my maybe my political views are known. It would be nice if we could get away from this again. Um, but, but I also, I also, uh, in the age of social media, I, 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 you know, I don't blame people for whether it's an Admiral McRaven um, or a Jim Mattis for for speaking out if they feel like they they have to. If things have gotten so bad in their mind. Um, uh, and so, you know, it's, it's hard. It's, it's a tough situation. Um, you know, I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I, I like, I, I, like I have a long track record on what I've said in the press and on Twitter. I got to live with that. You know, I said what I said, but, uh, and so, 
Um, uh, uh, but but I did so only because I love this country, and I thought what I would say would would make something make something better. I, I know, like I and I, and I as a, as a, as you know, I, I will I will repeat once again that my brothers and sisters of different political ideologies who I served with in really bad places, you know, have a seat at my table anytime because I know that if I was in ever any danger or anything going on, I you know, if I called them, even if I was like demonstrating across the street from them somewhere, you know, uh, they they'd be they'd be uh, they'd right. have my back, but. But you're right that you know that old norm of, of not not being kind of out there um, uh, has been uh, has been broken. Um, you know, I think it's it's a real it was a really unique time. That's yeah. that's, that's what I would yeah, say. Yeah, it real it really is. Um, and you know, what, one thing I want to ask you, Mark, is I, I, I absolutely think that you know, just because you're former CIA in your case former military in our case, I mean, you don't lose your political voice. You shouldn't, I mean, you have just as much a right to express yourself as, as anyone else in, in this country. However, I do have to say, not, not about you personally, but I was wondering if you think there are some of your agency colleagues, former military uh, general officers, who perhaps right. have gone a little bit too far in describing President Trump as a, you know, a Russian asset, this sort of insinuation uh, right, right, right. of treason um, yeah, w without evidence. So, so okay, so yeah, I, no, I, I, that, that, that's that's a great question, and I, I was always very careful on this. I mean, so, so it, you know, so I was there for the first two years of the Trump administration. It was a mystery to me about the contacts between the Trump campaign and the Russians, and it still is to this day. But I will say, and I have said very clearly, we have, you know, when when we catch a spy, it's from a penetration of the Russian intelligence service, and until we have someone tell us. A penetration that that Trump was an agent. Right, I don't right. believe he was. I just don't. The idea that there's some some analysts sitting in the bowels of CIA trying to catch it, like that doesn't happen. We catch spies based on a penetration saying that we are running this person. Right. So when it comes to Trump, um, you know, do I believe he's a Russian agent? No, but he's sure freaking complicated. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and his affinity for Putin. And so, so I was always really careful in all of my comments on that because I think it's it's dangerous to say that you know because you, you, you know, as an intelligence officer, former intelligence officer, you have to have evidence behind the kind of assertions. Um, what I can't explain is his affinity for Putin, and it drove me crazy. Um, you know, and and you know maybe one day we'll find out. Who knows? Is there business interest, business ties? That doesn't even matter. But but I think but your your premise is right. Is you have to be really careful in making those. Kind of sweeping generalizations without without hard evidence, because um, if there was hard evidence, you know, uh, uh, he wouldn't be president. You know, the, so the, you know, you could argue about the impeachment one way or the other. But if if the CIA, if the DIA, if NSA picked up something where there was a a, a you know an SVR officer running, you know, uh, Trump, you know, he's not president anymore. Um, right. That has never happened. Uh, and 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 so what I always tell people is the history of kind of the, the Trump campaign's dalliance with the Russians, because it did happen, is going to be told when we, when someone brings out the Russian intel files on this. Um, you know, there's there's the famous book, and it's it's worth, you know, called the Matrokin Files. A long time ago, there was a dump of, of huge, uh, 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 you know, a uh, uh, KGB kind of history. That's when we'll find out what happened. Um, until then, you know, uh, uh, it, it's all, but, but you got to be really careful on this. I mean, you know, I, I kind of, because, uh, because, you know, one of the things, and, and you know, my, my friends are, oh, will, get, will get annoyed with me now is the fact of the matter is when I was in the seat, here's, here's why I had my, my sleepless nights. There is a really weird affinity that, that, that President Trump has with Putin. Um, uh, uh, all of the things about Russian dis disinformation, Rudy Giuliani, you know, is really disturbing to me. That said, we also conducted a lot of offensive activity against the Russians. A uh, CIA was was you know we were tasked to push back against the Russians, and we did so with White House approval. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's that's what makes this such a vexing, strange problem that you you could never kind of put your you kind of put your right, finger right. around. My friends on the right say we were the hardest policy wise against the Russians in a long time. They're not wrong. Um, but but then you know whether it's the Helsinki summit or his kind of you know his inability you know you know uh, uh, the, all, you know the the Roger Stone contact with WikiLeaks I mean in the intelligence game that like this is really bad it's it's I don't know it's it, I you know I, I like you know I I, uh, I think that the Mueller report which I think was really flawed 
was accurate only in the sense is it's it's just still it's a story that hasn't been written yet and so i think that's kind of a fair characterization that i know i'm trying to kind of uh, you know dance dance what's it called dancing between the raindrops here and satisfy everybody but you know trump's not a russian agent but certainly he loves putin but we push back hard against the russians and a lot of trump's policies you know ultimately i think helped you know kind of uh, you know in, in in russia's pushback against nato in the west so i don't know Go figure. I, I think that's a fair characterization. Is, is it possible, and I don't know, is it possible that he just identified with or admired Putin's style of leadership or yeah. his machismo or whatever, right. but, but also recognized Russia itself as a threat? Absolutely. So, you know, that, that is entirely, I mean, so my, my favorite uh, 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 token I brought back from my trip to Moscow was a coffee mug where you had a shirtless Putin on a horse with a shirtless Trump, you know, uh, you know, riding together on horse on, on the same horse. I mean, th- you know, maybe they're one of the same. You know, th- you know that Trump just admires his, his you know, that that kind of Russian and, and Putin, you know, personifies that machismo. Um, I think that I think that you know that, that to me is a little you know, and, and I you know I, I think about this that, that a lot. It's just, there's there's too much evidence out there though of this. Yeah, and, and perhaps it can be explained by the naivete of the of the Trump campaign or the Roger Stones. There's just too much contact with the Russians. I mean, at some point, you know, it, and maybe it's because Trump was so naive coming in in the entire campaign. But this this can't happen. You can't have this with our adversary. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you know that. And, and then of course, you know, Rudy Giuliani running around the world. I mean, you know, which and my understanding is that everyone from National Security uh, Advisor O'Brien to Attorney General Bill Barr is telling Trump like. You got to stop this. Like your your personal lawyer is, is acting like a lunatic, but but Trump's like that's Rudy. Well, you yeah. can't because Rudy's is, is in, in in concert with Russian intelligence. Whether witting or not doesn't matter. He's pushing disinformation, so it's a really muddled story. I mean, this is going to be studied in history for yeah. generations. And, you're right. You know, we'll have watched it, but it is a it's a it's an incredible story where people get very passionate about. But the true counterintelligence professionals are are certainly uh, uh, scratching their head because this isn't normal. What happened? Well. Trump's not normal, and and what I mean by that, I mean he he's a Queens, a New York businessman. Right. Him and Giuliani are bosom buddies that go way back. I mean, there was a photo I think ages ago with Giuliani and Drag and Trump like rubbing it. Right? <laughs> Didn't that happen? And but you know, right. yeah, uh, yeah you know, like a publicity thing. Like they go way back. It's possible that Trump never. You know, he didn't grow up in Congress or spend any time as a politician. Right. So it's possible he's just freewheeling as a businessman, not understanding the implications of, like you say, these contacts or, or whatever else. I, I think that, that you, you, you make a very good case there. Look, Donald Trump for me, so look, I grew up in New Jersey. I mean, Donald Trump for me was Howard Stern. I mean, I love this stuff. Like, if you listen to Howard the, 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 when, when Trump put on Howard Stern, it was a, it was a, it was a zoo. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, Trump was page six of the, of the New York New York Post. Yeah, you know, and of all of his uh, all, all the crazy stuff. So, um, you know, if you're a New Yorker from New Jersey, you know, like I was, like you know, this, you know, you certainly certainly you understand who, who, who Trump was. Um, uh, I think Giuliani's gone a little off the wall over the years. I mean, you know, it, you know, his his kind of recent behavior is a little a little disconcerting. But I will tell you, in my office, I had you know, I had a picture of. Uh, you know, after 9-11 of, uh, of Bush, George, you know, George, George W. Bush and Giuliani together at 9-11 with the bullhorn. And there's mm-hmm, famous, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, you know, the kind of leadership um, uh, stories of George W. Bush. Giuliani was right there. I mean, did an extraordinary job. Uh, you know, I think, you know, it might be a more fascinating story of Giuliani's kind of descent into uh, uh, a kind of little bit of nuttiness rather than, uh, than Trump. But Trump has been Trump the whole time. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a, the the whole the whole the, the the Trump presidency. Trust me, will be studied by political yes. scientists and historians, it will. Um, but also counterintelligence professionals. I mean, one day we're going to get our we're going to get our hands on Russian the Russian intel intel files on this. It's going to be fascinating, and and probably it's going to be just as muddled now as uh, then as it is now. Like you yeah. know, um, yeah. you could see how. Look, there is there are, there are are times where. Trump probably does things so provocatively in favor of the Russians that the Russians would say, "That's actually too much." I, I, I don't know if that makes sense. It make, yeah. makes sense to you all. And so, if, if Trump was truly a Russian agent, he's not hiding it. 
Right. <laughs> you know, so I just, you know, it's, you know, a Russian agent doesn't, doesn't show his complete affinity to Putin, um, you know, openly. Right, right, I right. mean, so the whole thing's complicated, but it's, but I tell you, I have some sleepless nights over it. The, the one thing, and this is going to drive probably all your viewers crazy, especially my former, uh, some of the, some of the, my, my friends at Ground Branch. Um, when, when Trump invited Lavrov um, uh, and Ser old. Sergei Kislyak to the famous Oval Office meeting, and he kind of, and he was kind of denigrating James Comey, who he had just fired. I was scratching, and, and basically he said to the Russian interference, like, my bad, you guys are good. That was like, and I wrote about it a lot, and, and a lot of people were upset about it, but it was like, that, that's, the, that's if, like, George W. Bush invited in bin Laden after 9-11 and said, yeah, we're okay. It's not the same thing, but it sort of is. I mean, it's not 3,000 American dead, but it was, a, you know, it's a... Uh, it, it just just Trump violated so many of the norms of, of uh, that that uh, that I think has driven us all. Uh, I, trust me, there's a lot of people I think probably on both sides of the aisle who just want some normalcy now. I think probably Mitch McConnell is probably the number one yeah. person who just wants to kind of uh, uh, you know get, you know take a, take a take a knee, take a breather. I don't know. Well, there was nothing normal. I mean, you said you know the normalcy. <laughs> I mean, he walked in North Korea. You know, it, like, like right. nothing. He's a showman. In all ways, yeah. to to his detriment, I think, you know, I, I I think that people would have a very different opinion of him had he stayed off Twitter, had he not yeah. oh, been yeah. so yeah, yeah. you know brazen. Right. If you were looking, no, at I, him, I agree. I mean, so you know, I have I have very good friends who were experts on North Korea who thought a lot of of what he was doing was actually quite quite brilliant. Um, quite interesting. Brilliant is the wrong word. Interesting. Different. So it's it's taking a different tact on a really intractable problem. What do you do about the North Koreans? Um, I think ultimately it didn't work. Uh, uh, but but I think you know the, the the story of the Trump. Not let's 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 leave it at, at the, the the Trump foreign policy is that he did things so differently. Sometimes he was right. Um, getting NATO to pay more. You know, is is a good thing. Getting NATO members to pay their shares. No, no one disagrees with that. Obama was trying to get NATO to do that, but I think he probably hijacked himself with a lot of silliness um, yeah. that was unnecessary. So well, you know, I was uh, massively in favor of this uh, Soleimani strike. You know, I thought that was for Iran yeah. to go. There's nothing you can do to us, and then two weeks later, I was like, so so you know, that's that's a, that's a whole other. So the Soleimani strike, I came out. You know, so so first of all, Qasem Soleimani deserved to die. Yeah. Um, and so, so I was. I, I just didn't like the way it was done because I think it could have been done under different circumstances. Under, in fact, what we call Title Fifty, um, it could have been a, a, a strike that's not attributable, like the Israelis or like we do it. Um, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't always in favor of uh, uh, of kind of the chest thumping that happened afterwards because I think that invites more of an Iranian response. I think we got lucky. Lucky is a terrible word. I think when when COVID hit and when the Iranians shot down the Ukrainian airliner. It caused so much internal dissension in Iran, um, uh, but but ultimately, uh, uh, I think that, that you know the, the you know killing Qasem Soleimani, um, uh, you know, no one sheds a tear on that whatsoever. I, just, I, I wish we had done it in a non-attributable fashion. That was kind of my beef with that. But look, you know, it's a it, it's a real bad guy taking off the battlefield. No, I mean, there's a lot of U.S. forces who uh, yeah. uh, there's a lot of you know who, who I think uh, are a lot of a lot of U.S. servicemen who were killed or injured because of, directly because of him. I don't think Trump. Would have been able to do it in a non-tributal way. That's true. You know, yeah, right. when, when Iran <laughs> publicly, enough, right? yeah. when Iran yeah. publicly tells him you can't do anything, and yeah, like Jack and I discussed this when it happened because I don't even know if it was everything like COVID and all that. I think Iran and, and the leaders in Iran actually go. We don't know how far to push this guy because we we legit do not know what he will do. That, that, that's the old that's the old kind of the, you know when when people thought you know Nixon was crazy or Reagan was crazy you know and so but I, but I think that that uh, uh, I still think that the the, the Soleimani strike you know that that chapter hasn't ended um, I think that you know and and I always said that you know it, it might be beyond a Trump presidency but but I you know the, the Iranians are going to try to you know seek revenge on this and then there's there's a lot of US you know uh, uh, military and diplomatic personnel who are exposed. Not to say that. Let me let me just put this in a in a in a in a, in a, in a very clinical fashion. I worked with the Israelis for years um, on very sensitive operations. When the Israelis choose to conduct a targeted killing, they do a very meticulous analysis of the repercussions that might come 
between zero and 10 years later, right. they will say, if we do this, we're going to lose an embassy. And they go ahead and they do it anyway. Um, so I think that that America just has to be prepared that when we do something like, you know, kill Qasem Soleimani, which was a righteous thing to do there, you know, this is not a free lunch that right. this might come come back to us uh, down the line. I'm OK with that. Um, uh, but I just I just, you know, that I, it, it's, it's worth it's worth making the point that that this is not going to, uh, 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 you know, go unanswered, I think, um, right. uh, down the line. So, Mark. Uh, Jim says, thank you for the, doing this as a senior intel officer. Is there pressure to act in certain ways publicly, not with classified info, but in other ways? Hmm. Not sure. So, I, I, I mean, like, the, the only thing I'll say is that, you know, so, so we have, a, you know, when, when, I, when we sign a secrecy agreement, um, everything that I do and say, I'm very careful on. Uh, maybe this is what he's, he's alluding to. Uh, uh, you know, whether I talk in, in you know, speeches, you know, I'm, I, I, I wrote a book on leadership that's going to come out next July. It's called Clarity in Crisis. I'm really excited about this because I think that it has a lot of great leadership pr uh, principles for uh, uh, from my time at CIA. Um, but every like all these stories that I talk about now um, are cleared. When I talk to the media, it's all cleared. I'm really careful on this. Mm -hmm. One of the things that is extraordinary is the amount that the agencies will clear. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, so, the, you know, the story that this, I told you podcast, it's incredible. You no, know, I mean, and so, so, you know, and so, uh, you know, the story I told you about handling that agent mm -hmm. in the Middle East, they cleared all this stuff. Uh, now, of course, um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm not going to talk about someone who's active. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, uh, and, and the events I talked about in Iraq happened, you know, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but I'm really careful on this stuff. And, uh, and so you just, you have to, you have to adhere, adhere to your secrecy agreement. If not, you know, you, you, you kind of get jammed up a little bit. But, you know, um, I, my, my relationship with the agency's publication review board is, is I probably talk to them on a weekly basis because I, cause I <laughs> you know, I, 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 I write and I talk so much on stuff. It's Look, they do weird things. They're like, and, and I, of course, I violated it tonight. They're like, don't say JSOC, say SOCOM. Yeah, they, they don't like you to say, they won't let you yeah. say special operations. They make you say special forces. What? It, it, okay, whatever. And so, so you know, and so, so ultimately, um, uh, uh, I think we're all kind of really careful on this uh, because, because I, the the other thing is that as you as you as you asked me before is you know why do why do why does someone elect to speak out? I think there's a lot I can teach people about what CIA does. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's an indispensable institution. And, and, and let me just jump into politics one more time. We, if we're entering an, you know, a, a, an era where there's a Democratic administration, George, Joe Biden is a centrist. There's a lot of people on the left in the Democratic Party who probably don't like the CIA. Right. I think there's much. I think there's much as much of an audience, uh, you know, for me to speak and others to speak about the importance of the intelligence community and a strong intelligence community and strong authorities for the intelligence community. Um, uh, because I think there's going to be kind of, you know, th th we're going to shift a little bit to struggles with, okay, does, does, does the intelligence com community involve itself in targeted killings? Um, what is the, you know, should we conduct covert action? Mm -hmm. These are real questions that are, that are going to happen. Uh, they're going to come forward. And I think there's a lot that, that, that the formers can say, um, on both, you know, like, yes, yes, we should do X, Y, and Z, but maybe not as much here. Um, uh, that's what, that's kind of what I, what I plan to do. A lot of my friends are like, Oh, you know, Biden's going to be elected and you're not going to say anything anymore. And I, that's just not true. Um, because frankly, and this is getting too political, like I, I, I am as opposed to um, some of the things that Trump did and said as, as, as to AOC mm -hmm. um, and kind of that, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, kind of what I think is a radical agenda. So I'm a centrist, true and true. And I think we need a strong intelligence community and I'll, I'll, I'll fight for that as much as I can. We're not going to defund the CIA. That's right. I mean, you know, come on. Uh, <laughs> although, but you know, but but some people want to. I mean, look. Yeah. The, I know, the, right, the, right. the irony is that the, you know, so 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 many in, in the intel community became the darlings of the left as we trashed the yeah, Trump administration. It's weird. Um, it's weird. You know, because 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 before I was a baby killer. You know. Yeah. Uh, we, we all were. So, so we all were, Mark. Right. <laughs> and so you know, so so I you know I I believe very strongly in the importance of. Of, uh, of the intelligence community, of, mm -hmm. of special operations forces. I think just, you know, to throw one other thing out there, I think there's a really good debate to be had now is what do we do about kind of unconventional warfare? What do we do about Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq? Um, I wasn't in favor of kind of the Trump, let's let's get up and, and get out and leave. Um, but the never...
never ending wars, you know, have to have to end. Uh, we America has to kind of project power, but it's got to be it's got to do so in, in, in kind of a responsible fashion. Um, these are really good, you know, debates to be had now. So I think that 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 the, that all of us, you know, even on you know everyone on this program has a lot to offer to that uh, uh, because uh, you know right right now you know th- th- you know what's going to happen in Afghanistan. I'm trying to get through these quickly here, Mark. Uh, the Killer Angel, he says, I've read a few things about reflexive control and its impact on American political discourse. Do you think current levels of political polarization and misinformation can be fixed? Or is this the new normal in America? That's What a great question. Yeah, I, I, that's, a, that's a great question. So, so one of the things that distressed me the most was kind of the, the disinformation piece. Um, not only that it was coming from the Russians, but that... But, because look, our adversaries, whereas the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians, are going to put forward disinformation. The thing that bothered me was the willingness of, of large swaths of the American yeah. populace um, to kind of take that in. It's really hard to combat that. Right. Um, you know, and so, so you know, the, the, and, and the best way to combat disinformation is, is, is you know, and, and what we did, you know, to push back on Russian covert influence is to push, is, is, to, is to say what the Russians are doing. Right. Um, uh, uh, but it's but it's hard. Like, like, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, Facebook. This is a whole other program you could have. You know, the, the you know, uh, the the is Facebook a a, a a you know something of 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 good or something of evil? Um, you know, there's you know, Facebook puts forth an astounding amount of information more so than CNN, MSNBC, and Fox combined. Um, so it's hard. Uh, you know, you know, where do people get their news? Where do people get their truth? Um, uh, so, you know, I don't, I don't know the exact answer. I think right now, you know, if you, you can live in your little bubble of watching CNN, MSNBC, um, other people who watch Fox, OAN, or on, or on kind of, you know, uh, 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 on kind of Facebook chats have a different version of what's happening at the election. So, right. um, it's, uh, it's, it's really, I will tell you though, what, what, what was the most disheartening to me was when Rudy Giuliani's running around with kind of all of his Ukrainian conspiracy theories and, and elements of the U S kind of political um, uh, of, of polity are, are kind of are kind of running with it. That to me was uh, was something that that was really disturbing. I just I thought that was um, you know despite efforts of the FBI and the IC and others to kind of uh, you know uh, uh, ed- educate folks. So this is not going to go away with uh, with uh, with the election. It's it's it's, it's here to stay. T Bar says, uh, and I think you already answered this largely, but sure. uh, can Mark comment on the challenges of bouncing between a kinetic mission and the CT fight? Versus traditional intel seems like a big perspective oh, yeah. change. That's that is a great question because I think that we have to um, uh, with with what we you know the, the buzzword is near peer competition, which means China Russia. So we have to move ourselves away from kind of the kinetic CT mission while still doing it sometimes to kind of the near peer competition. China is obviously our biggest kind of strategic uh, adversary. Russia is you know metals and kind of tortures us constantly. Um, what I would argue, though, is that we also, you don't only shift resources. CIA officers, CIA stations have to shift back to kind of back to basics, Russia, China stuff. Um, CT is still important. I would argue also that the U.S. military does as well, um, including the, you know, the, uh, the, the special operations community. Um, and so, uh, so it's a really good question. And so, so you know, the way, I, the way I dealt with it when I dealt with my special operations colleagues is, you know, goddamn, like, who's better in manhunting? Than the U.S. government and and to narrow it down, the IC and 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 JSOC or SOCOM, uh, no doubt, right? I mean, man hunting is, is what we do. Mm-hmm. Soleimani strikes a perfect example. Why not shift that to finding out what the GRU officers are doing all over Europe? Why can't SOCOM shift to that to that mission? Um, now you might have to look a little different, you know, if you're if you're you know six foot six one white dude with tats and a, and a buzz cut, um, you know, you, that might not be the profile to send them into to Paris. Um, uh, but but JSOC and, and SOCOM have to evolve as is the agency, so we should take that same manhunting mentality and mm-hmm. push it to the near peer. Um, it's going to take some more training, you know, some, you know, uh, uh, some more tradecraft training. But as I left, I was I was talking about this to the kind of the special operations community. There was enormous receptivity to that because you know I think that's where that's where we have to go. So there has to be that kind of shift. Yeah, yeah. Player Paul says thanks for your service. Uh, wanting to be a doctor in the military and considering going into the agency after worth the pay cut and the secret lifestyle. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. <laughs> of course it is. Look, 
you know, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, so, so, but, but this, that, that translates into a really vexing problem we have. So look, I, you know, so, so you can make a, a living uh, in the U.S. government. Um, you all, you, you know, you both know that. Uh, 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 so, you know, you have a middle class lifestyle. Maybe you have some fancy housing when you're in an embassy overseas, but you're going to do fine. The problem is, is not that. The problem is, what do you do with a kid coming out of, I don't know, MIT or the University of Chicago? Who can go get a job for two hundred thousand dollars with a tech company, or come as a GS nine and make seventy five thousand dollars in the U.S. government? So we have to be able to be competitive in terms of our uh, in terms of our hiring of world class talent. You know, doctors, sure. I mean, you know, look. I mean, you know, we have plenty of docs. Um, uh, uh, but I but I think that that there's got to be kind of a, a a change in focus on on hiring because we're not going to be competitive. Um, in, in getting that kind of talent, not necessarily in the case officer cadre, we're a bunch of kind of knuckle draggers, just like, you know, you were from, the, I mean, you know, you're going to get people who do that. but, but in terms of kind of, tech, we, we need data scientists, right. you know, we need people who know about artificial intelligence, right. um, you know, Google and Facebook are going to gobble these people up and pay them a lot of money. The U S government's got to be able to do that. So, so I would say, you know, is it worth it? Look, serving your country is always worth it. I mean, the, 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 the I don't know. I just, you know, I've just retired, so I don't know what the private sector is like in terms of, of you know. I mean, I wrote a book, and so and I talk a lot. Um, but I'll tell you, the motivation is always there because because there's nothing greater than, than kind of serving your country for the greater good. But you got to pay. You, there, there's got to be there's got to be a, a way to attract talent, and and that has to be kind of with increased pay. Uh, again, you know, uh, and, and then and then and then just to flip it one thing further, and and this you know this might um, you know resonate with you all. U.S. government deals with brick and mortar facilities, like so. So Facebook and Google, all these places during the pandemic, you know, banks, Wall Street learned how to operate from their homes. These are billion-dollar industries with proprietary information that's just as sensitive as the agencies. Mm-hmm. We have to be able to, to kind of move away from you know an embassy facility or or Langley or the Pentagon and be able to kind of work in a in a uh, in an environment. Um, uh, you know, and that you know these are, these are things that I think about independently you know, and yeah. No, that's a great comment, actually, Mark. I was going to think about that. Um, but tell us about your book, sure. what it's about, where we're going to be able to find it, what's going sure. on with that. So it's, it's a great story because, you know, so the, the, anyway, the book is called Clarity in Crisis. Um, you know, I was very lucky. Harper Collins is, is my publisher, WME, which is William Morris Endeavor. It's a great, you know, literary, uh, you know, a talent agency is, is uh, is behind me. It's going to come out in June of 2021. I think it's going to come out on Amazon pre-sale next month. Um, but what I did was, so when I left, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do in life. I did a little consulting for, you know, we have a whole bunch of, uh, of, uh, of kind of firms that, that teach tradecraft to the special operations community. So I did that. I trained some SEALs on tradecraft or surveillance detection. But but ultimately, I, I, I wanted to write a book on leadership. And so it's not a biography. It's not an autobiography. It's not a hero worship kind of crap thing because ultimately my life you know taught me so much about dealing with failure so i wanted to write a book on leadership um with kind of key principles you know such as adversity and humility uh and uh and so i did so and you know it's 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 in the process of editing i think it's going to be really well received because um you know it's a it's a book about about how to deal with kind of all aspects of life so you know it's nine core principles i kind of give you know, some examples and, and, and help for if it's a, you know, if it's a private sector client and what to do. But for example, you know, the, one of my key principles, I talk about the glue guy or the glue girl. And what does the glue guy mean? You know, every organization, every unit, military unit, every platoon, every agency station has individuals who are not the superstars, but are absolutely integral um, uh, to, uh, uh, to the success of, of, of a mission. And when I talk about clarity and crisis, is these are these are fundamentals that when times are really tough, when there's adversity, when you don't know what's going on, you'll be able to make decisions, um, which actually are not so difficult to make. So what does that mean? You need a glue guy. You need these fundamental individuals. It's a support officer, um, uh, 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 you know, to be able to kind of give you that 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 that, that feeling of, of confidence that uh, that there are people behind you. Um, I talk, you know, one of my other principles is, is I talk, you know, adversity is the PED to, uh, to success, the performance enhancing drug to success. You can't succeed in life if you haven't failed before. Right. So again, when you're, when you're down, when you're, when you're facing some kind of decision in, in, in times of, you know, lack of situational awareness, um, 
if you haven't failed before, you're not going to be able to make that decision and, and you know, what you've learned from it. Uh, you know, I, 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 one of my other principles I talk about, um, win an Oscar. And that's, that's the ability of an officer to get up in front of people and to have that kind of sense of authority. You have to have some empathy. You have to have compassion. Um, I learned that, you know, it, it's, it's a great story behind that. I, you know, we came back from one of, you know, one of the, one of the kind of the, the ground branch, um, uh, missions, you know, I've been out for 36 hours, hadn't slept. I go sit in the chow hall of skin. I'd never do this, but I just sit by myself and the fricking base falls apart. Like, like over, over the next, over the next, you know, 15 minutes. The, uh, and, and you all know this, these are, these are ground branch folks who are former special operations, uh, uh, personnel who, who were in, you know, events in Somalia, Black Hawk Down, we're in Tora Bora. It's, and I didn't talk to them because I wanted to be by myself. It's like the whole world fell apart because I, because I made a mistake. I didn't say to them, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm freaking beat tired. So instead of me like yucking it up and trying to be who I always was, I'm gonna go sit by myself. I said, so, so that that principle of win an Oscar is really important. And again, in times of ambiguity, when you have to have these kind of critical decision making. And in the book, I kind of, I, I, I you know, um, I end it with with putting it all together. And it's a, it's an HVT operation in Skin, and I, and I can tell you about it. Ultimately, we were looking for um, a, a really senior HVT who was responsible for the deaths of hundreds of Americans. Um, I had left. I, I was not the base chief anymore. I was back in our headquarters. Um, I get called down and, and by a very senior officer who says, what should we do right now? We can, we can, uh, uh, I gotta be careful on this. We can launch an operation to a, a capture or kill operation. Um, he said, what do you think we should do? And so the principles that I talk about all kind of led into this, um, uh, you know, adversity is the PD success. We, we tried before on this individual, we had failed. We learned our lesson. Um, you know, win an Oscar. They're asking me, you know, so, so everyone's looking at me to make the call. You know, how can I make this call with lack of situational awareness, except I really do have that situation. It's an easy call to make. Um, and so ultimately when we make the call and, and, an officer literally a senior officer at CI literally says to me, if you're wrong, this is your career. And I said, that's fine. You know, launch, let's go. And there's, <laughs> wow. the, and, 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 and it was a success. And right. afterwards, people were like how like it was total confusion. Like, like how did how did you make that decision? I was like, it was easy because these fundamental building blocks we went into, yeah, it was so clear to me. Even to the point of you know, uh, uh, you know, I talk about things like you know, I, one of my principles is the process monkey. It's training an agent. We had trained an agent on the ground. I knew this guy. I felt totally confident. And so at a time where there's this incredible you know uh, uh, ambiguity, was a lack of situational awareness, where people like wanted want want to say no. You can say yes, and I know these are a lot of kind of cliches I'm throwing out there, but I think there's a lot to it. I, I, my, my my friends from the Navy SEAL community will get pissed. Every Navy SEAL in Buds like is thinking about his his book deal. That's a really terrible thing to say, but you know it's true. Like everybody in the SEAL community writes a book, right? We're with you. I mean, Jack, you wrote a book. What the fuck? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> right. So so, but 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 not many this CIA one. people have written a book. Right. On, on leadership, I mean, so you know, so, so I thought like this is this is kind of interesting because we have this kind of different perspective on stuff, right? Um, and so I'm really excited for this. I think it'll it'll you know it'll resonate, and if it doesn't, so what? You know, I don't know. Like, what do I have to lose? No, so I'm excited I about. think. Yeah, I mean, Jesus, this has been a fascinating conversation. I think it's going to be great. What, what say the name of your book one more time? It's called Clarity in Crisis. It'll be pre-sale on Amazon in about a month. Probably next month. It'll next month. I'll, I'll send you all a note. It'll be uh, uh, yeah. pre-sale next month, um, and then published in June of uh, of uh, of two thousand and twenty-one. And I will tell you a funny story that my agent said because we, we raised the political thing. So he says, so so my my agent at the at WMA, William Morris, he's like, okay, there's two ways to sell a book. You got to go on two shows. You got to go on NPR to the left. You got to go on Fox and Friends for the right. So he's like, he's right. Calm down your. He's going. He goes. Calm your frickin' Twitter feed. <laughs> you got to go on Fox and Friends. And I said, I got time. Uh, so, uh, so he was right. So I think it'll, I, I'm excited. It'll be fun. Uh, that's awesome, Mark. And uh, I'm, we will have you back on the show as we get closer to that publication date. Oh, sure. Because, Love I mean, you've got such a, a breadth of experience that there's much more we can talk about. Um, sure, sure. So, you know, if you're willing and we, we haven't alienated oh, yeah. too bad, we, we would love to have you back. <laughs> No, look, I, I, I you know, and, and this is, I'll, I'll make a little plug for you all. I love the show, and I love the show not only because it's informal, but you have such a great range and crazy cast of characters because that was our <laughs> life. I mean, I, I was joking before that, you know, you had, you had your, your buddy who was, uh, 
in, the, in, a, in a French Foreign Legion. Like, yeah, yeah. so you know, I've been to French Foreign Legion bars in Djibouti. Like, when you said you had that on, I was like, I gotta listen to this because uh, I, I saw those fun. Yeah, that's a know, great one. And, uh, it's so much fun, and so so what our community has, whether it's intelligence or special operations, um, or you know conventional, it doesn't matter. It's just characters, and it's so fun to hear the stories because um, everyone thinks I'm, I'm crazy. You know, we're all crazy, but you know, and and we these are really life and death situations and terrible things we went through. But when it was a hell of a ride, and, yeah. and you meet some crazy characters along the way, and if you can't kind of get off on on, on that part of life, and that you know that the, just the interesting people you meet, you know. Um, uh, you know, you're, you're you're living a dull life, so that's why I love the show, and I love I love all the different kind of diverse right. characters yeah, you have on. You, I'm, I'm, it's on. I'm, I'm thank, thanks for having me on. I had a blast. Well, we're honored. Uh, I mean, you yeah. know, we're the lucky ones because we get to have this wild, crazy cast of, of fascinating people <laughs> oh, on sure. our show and talk to them. You know? And on that note, please uh, remember to like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you're interested in supporting the channel and keeping us going, there's a link down in the description to our Patreon page where you'll get access to bonus segments and Teespring. Uh, check out our Teespring. I think the link is below. The link's um, in the description. I would maybe avoid the t-shirts and the sweatshirts for now. That's not how you're supposed to sell merch, Dave. <laughs> um, where are they? No, the, the t well, no, all, all kidding aside... We got some T-shirts and like hoodie sweatshirts printed out, and the logo came out like a little faded, more so than we want to. The coffee mugs actually look really good, though. I think, you know, happy with how they came out. Uh, we need to thank uh, Joey also. Joey, thank you for that. Yeah, uh, Joey. It says one of the best episodes yet. Thank you, man. Rangers in the way. Uh, so here's this is the hoodie. As you can see, it looks a little faded. So we're gonna call this um, vintage. It's a, <laughs> it's a vintage hoodie, uh, stone washed. Um, and then the t-shirts, we're not super happy with how the logo came out. We probably have to color it. just it needs to be a little darker, that's all. We just want to let you know so that you don't <laughs> get disappointed if you go buy one of them. But anyway, so that's what, that's what we're rolling with. But, but the coffee mugs came out nice. So thank you again, Mark. Um, I know we've thank kept you for like, what, two and a half hours. If we keep you for a, it, a yeah. bonus segment um, for like an extra like 15 minutes. Yeah, uh, no problem. Okay. okay, thanks, man. So... We're going to cut it here, and uh, next week, our guest is going to be Baz Basil. I don't know if you know him, Mark. He was a, a paramilitary guy back in the old days. Oh, no way. All right. Awesome. Yeah, back in the 80s. All right, so we'll kill the feed here. Thank you for joining us, everyone, tonight, and we'll see you next week, Friday, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and Ian at the last moment. Uh, thank you, Ian. What does Mark think a giraffe sells for on the black market? It's an inside joke. I don't know. <laughs> take a take a take a wild guess. What do you think you can get? I have no like, idea. Jesus. <laughs> it, it was like thirty five thousand dollars, actually, uh, according to a previous guest. But all right, guys, we'll wow. see everyone next week. Right. Thank you. And that.